Chapter One of Heroines of Travel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Heroines of Travel by Frank Mundell. Chapter One The Heroism of Travel. In all ages and in every country, travellers have been regarded with unusual interest by their own people to visit a strange land to face unknown dangers and to undergo privations voluntarily to satisfy a desire for travel has always been regarded as a species of heroism worthy of praise and admiration the majority of the early travellers in foreign countries the pioneers of commerce and civilization in various parts of the globe were in almost every instance men for though the early settlers were accompanied by female members of their families the work of exploration was regarded as essentially the business of a man and until recent times there have been few instances on record of long journeys being undertaken by women except in the performance of some family duty this was due no doubt to the fact that the explorer and traveller had not only to face the dangers and difficulties incidental to undeveloped countries where the means of communication and conveyance were of the rudest description and the climate more or less unhealthy but he might also have to encounter the hostility of barbarous natives and be compelled to fight his way through their country nor do we question the power of endurance or the courage of women when we say that they are not physically fitted to engage in such hazardous work as that performed by many of the pioneer explorers it is probably owing to the recognition of this fact by themselves that even in more modern times women travellers have journeyed in civilised or semi-civilised countries where even if they had to endure hardships their womanhood would be respected this limitation has lessened their opportunities for adventure and saved them from many of the perils which form the most attractive feature of the stories told by such men as sir john franklin henry morton stanley and the like only within the last half century have women engaged in travel on a large scale for its own sake and no doubt it is because of this fact that the biographer of madame ida pfeiffer describes that lady as one of the most remarkable women of modern times nor is this praise undeserved when we consider the journey she made without escort or protection of any kind since then however quite a number of women have dared to follow in her footsteps and have ventured into some of the least known countries of the world foremost among such women travellers are miss bird who became mrs bishop and miss gordon cumming the story of their wanderings in foreign lands fills many volumes and both ladies stand today in the front rank of modern travellers in the following pages we have brought together some of the incidents of travel recorded by these and other notable women there is no attempt at a continuous narrative of any one traveller's experiences and in choosing the incidents regard has been had to introducing the reader to a variety of countries End of chapter one chapter two of heroines of travel by frank mundell 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Round the World Madame Ida Pfeiffer is one of the earliest heroines of travel of whom we have any certain knowledge. She was a native of Vienna and was born in 1797. From an early age she was possessed with a desire to visit distant countries and peoples, but it was not until she was nearly fifty years of age that she found herself in a position to gratify her lifelong ambition. In 1846 she set out from Vienna on her famous journey round the world. On arriving at Rio Janeiro, she proceeded to make a number of excursions into the surrounding country. On one occasion, accompanied by a German friend, Count Berchtold, she set out to visit Persepolis, a German colony about 50 miles from Rio. As they travelled along the road, they observed that they were being followed by a negro. They thought nothing of the circumstance, however, as there were a number of people about, and they kept on their way. Suddenly, at a lonely part of the road, the negro sprang forward upon the travellers, brandishing a long knife, which he had hitherto concealed. Neither Madame Pfeiffer nor her companion were armed, and resistance seemed useless flight was equally out of the question for a time they warded off the ruffian's blows with their umbrellas finding that he could not break down their guard the negro seized the lady's umbrella and wrenched it from her grasp in the struggle he dropped his knife and she endeavoured to secure it but he got hold of it again and stabbed her twice in the left arm then the lady remembered that she had in her pocket a clasp knife. To open it was but the work of a second, and with great spirit she aimed a blow at the negro's breast, but only succeeded in wounding him on the hand. At the same moment the count seized him from behind. A slash from the negro's weapon, however, caused him to let go his hold. The travellers were now completely at the mercy of their assailant, and gave themselves up for lost, when they heard the clatter of hooves. The next instant, two horsemen were seen approaching, and the black fled into the woods, hotly pursued by the mounted men. Madame Pfeiffer and her companion continued on their way till they reached a house, where their wounds were dressed. Before they left, their assailant was brought in, securely bound. From his captors they learned that the man had been punished by his master for some act of disobedience, and had attacked the travellers with the hope of avenging himself on the whites. Resuming their journey, the travellers reached Persepolis without further adventure, and after a pleasant visit, returned to Rio. A few days later, they set out again for the interior of the country, where there was an Indian encampment. At first their way lay through extensive sugar plantations, but as they penetrated farther into the country, the cultivated portions became fewer in number and less in size, while the woods were thicker and more luxuriant. When they had travelled a little over a hundred miles, the Count was forced to call a halt. The wound which he had received in his encounter with the Negro was very much inflamed, and he felt that it would be dangerous for him to proceed farther. His companion, however, had suffered no ill effects, and was naturally anxious to press forward. She made inquiries as to the road and was informed that it was not more dangerous than any other in the country. She accordingly engaged a guide, and having armed herself with a double-barrelled pistol, set out. 
as she rode along she had magnificent views of burning forests which had been set on fire to clear the land for cultivation once her path lay between a burning forest on the one side and the smouldering ashes of a consumed wood on the other the path was shrouded in smoke and it was impossible to see even a short distance ahead her guide put spurs to his mule and dashed into the smoke closely followed by the daring lady the crackling of the timber the roaring of the flames combined with the dense vapour and oppressive heat made it no easy task to guide the stumbling mules along the narrow pathway at length after a hard gallop the traveller and her guide reached the other side in safety half blinded and nearly suffocated by the smoke madame pfeiffer spent the night in a small vendor or inn situated in the midst of a dense wood with her experience of a few days before still fresh in her mind it required all the nerve she possessed to lay down for the night in a dark room with neither shutters to the windows nor proper fastenings to the door after a ride of two hundred miles through swamps and forests and across trackless plains the intrepid traveller reached the indian encampment which she described as the most wretched and poverty-stricken place she had ever seen the houses were simply sheds of palm leaves the dress of the people consisted chiefly of a few rags tied round the waist and their only weapons were bows and arrows with ready tact she quickly won the good opinion of the natives who placed at her disposal the best of everything they possessed hunting parties were formed for her amusement and before she left the indians performed a war dance a great fire was kindled and around the blazing pile the warriors of the tribe went through all the movements of attacking and repulsing an enemy so realistic was this performance that the traveller became alarmed for her safety as the indians with fierce looks wild cries and threatening attitudes turned their arrows towards her she spent several weeks in these wild solitudes and then returned to rio janeiro leaving the brazilian capital on board an english ship madame pfeiffer sailed for valparaiso in passing through the straits of magellan violent storms were encountered the awful roll of the thunder seemed to fill the whole sky and vivid flashes of lightning illumined the sea with a lurid gleam through it all the traveller as was her custom sat on deck watching the war of the elements it took the vessel fourteen days to beat out of the strait and enter the pacific ocean still the gale continued the waves broke with such fury on board that several planks were torn out of the deck it was impossible to light a fire and she had to content herself with bread cheese and raw ham for dinner at length valparaiso was reached and the traveller embarked once more bound for tahiti the chief island of the society group she fell ill on the voyage and to the surprise of all on board she refused to take any medicine but prescribed for herself salt water baths which she took in a cask and by this means she was restored to health on tahiti madame pfeiffer had some remarkable adventures travelling in the interior was by no means easy on account of the numerous rivers which had to be crossed on one occasion she set out with a guide to visit lake vihera i was dressed she says in men's trousers and a blouse strong shoes 
and without stockings the way was repeatedly broken by rapid winding streams through one of which she had to wade sixty times the water in most instances came up to her waist and when a dangerous part had to be crossed the guide took firm hold of her hand and led her over half swimming half wading some idea of the difficulty of the way might be formed from the fact that it took her eight hours to travel eighteen miles when she at length reached the lake she was wet from head to foot and her hands and feet were cut and blistered with repeated falls not satisfied with the experiences of the journey she expressed to her guide a desire to cross the water he replied that there was but only one way to swim as this was too much for her she shook her head and prepared to return when the guide tore off some plantain branches and made a kind of rude raft by fastening them together with coarse grass he then placed it on the water and invited her to go on board madame pfeiffer was not wanting in nerve yet she shrank from risking her life on so frail a vessel her wish however to cross to the other side got the better of her apprehensions and she seated herself on the plantain leaves swimming behind it the guide pushed the frail craft to the other side and back again though it was quite often under water and the adventurous lady herself expected to be immersed at every moment the novel trip was accomplished in safety that night she encamped at the lakeside and on the following morning set out on the return journey walking in one day a distance of thirty-six miles from tahiti madame pfeiffer sailed to hong kong she was the first european woman who had dared to travel unprotected in the celestial empire we cannot but admire the courage she displayed in walking through the chinese streets without a guard of some sort the fact that she was well acquainted with the danger only adds greater merit to her action but her daring did not end here in defiance of all that had ever been known in that part of the world she took a passage on board a chinese junk bound for canton armed with a pair of pistols well primed she embarked with a set of the most murderous looking piratical fellows the voyage was accomplished without incident on arriving at canton she obtained a guide to conduct her to the european quarter as she passed along the streets her appearance caused great excitement men women and children came to their doors to stare at her and followed her down the street with shouts and cries of derision soon there was quite a large crowd following her she walked on as if innocent of the cause of all the commotion and to this circumstance she doubtless owed her life on reaching her destination she was heartily welcomed and all expressed their surprise that she had not been stoned by the populace madame pfeiffer spent about a month in canton during which she never missed an opportunity of gratifying her love of adventure and her desire for information many pagodas were visited and she also made an excursion round the walls of the city in this instance she was forced to adopt male attire had her sex been known her life would not have been worth a moment's purchase her most alarming adventure in china happened when she visited a tea garden never before had a european viewed the secrets of tea drying and this coupled with the fact that the visitor was a woman 
roused the hatred of the workpeople to such an extent that the authority of their master was not sufficient protection pointing at the intruder they rose from their work and pressed round her with threatening shouts in vain their master ordered them to return to their duties till at last he requested his visitor to bring her visit to an end as soon as possible calm and collected as ever madame pfeiffer inspected the various operations of preparing the tea-leaf for the market and then took her departure to the great relief of her host from china she travelled eastward visiting the wonders of ceylon and india in the latter country she took part in a tiger hunt from the back of an elephant the exciting and dangerous sport was greatly enjoyed by the traveller who expected every moment to see the fierce brute spring on to the elephant's head and seize the native driver in this hunt two fine specimens of the bengal tiger were obtained on her way from delhi to bombay madame pfeiffer had one of the most unpleasant experiences of her travels the man who drove her wagon had a habit of turning round and staring fiercely at her from time to time at first she thought nothing of it attributing his strange conduct to curiosity but as time went on his attentions became more and more unpleasant one day while they were travelling through a wild and lonely district the man got down from the cart and walked behind it carrying in his hand a heavy axe the traveller felt as if her last hour had come and watched the man secretly yet keenly in the hope that she would have time to make good use of her pistols before the fatal blow could be delivered the man followed the wagon for an hour he then got up to his seat and drove on in silence again he dismounted axe in hand and behaved in the same strange manner as on the former occasion after another hour of terrible suspense for the traveller he resumed his proper position and contented himself with staring at her till the end of the journey at bombay madame pfeiffer embarked on board a steamer bound for bassora the voyage across the arabian sea and up the persian gulf was accomplished in safety and the unweary traveller at once proceeded to visit baghdad babylon and nineveh thence she crossed over persia to tabriz and after a long and fatiguing ride crossed the frontier into the confines of the russian empire the hardships of her journey had hitherto been rendered less irksome by occasional acts of kindness and hospitality and she had become accustomed to be treated with a certain amount of consideration and respect but no sooner had she entered the dominions of the tsar than a great change manifested itself being unable to speak the native language she was entirely at the mercy of the imperial officials she had a letter of introduction to a german physician in the town of natsgiven but was unable to find him while wandering about she was pounced on by the custom-house officers and marched to headquarters there she was ordered to unlock her portmanteau and the inspector's wife at once began to rummage among the contents finding nothing of a contraband or treasonable nature they returned it to her without even taking the trouble to replace the articles they had removed they next turned their attention to a small wooden box which they were about to break open with a heavy hatchet this was more than the traveller could stand the box contained many relics from babylon and nineveh and she feared that they would be destroyed 
regardless of consequences she seized the box and tried by signs to make the men understand what it contained but in vain they either would not or could not comprehend her meaning her action accordingly made the officials all the more determined to open the box for they not unnaturally thought under the circumstances that it contained something which she was afraid to show they accordingly forced the box open and to their disappointment found a few fragments of brick and several pieces of carving they then allowed her to proceed on her way after this hoping to travel in greater safety and comfort she joined a caravan of tartars but even then she could not escape unpleasant adventure one day they encamped about fifty yards from the road and while a meal was getting ready madame pfeiffer walked along the highway she had not gone far when she saw a car approaching in which were seated a russian and a cossack soldier armed with a musket not wishing to be questioned by the officers she turned to go back to the encampment as she walked along she became aware that the car had stopped almost at the same moment she was seized from behind it was the cossack who was holding her and he endeavoured to drag her along with him she pointed towards the caravan and tried to explain that she belonged to it but in vain the man did not slacken his grip for an instant exerting all her strength she tried to free herself but she was no match for her powerful antagonist who finding that his prisoner was likely to prove troublesome clapped his hand over her mouth and carried her to the car she was then taken in charge by the russian who held her firmly down and covered her mouth so that she could not cry out the horses were driven forward at their utmost speed till the next post-house was reached when she was put into an empty room and guarded by the cossack here the traveller found time to think over the events of the last half hour and came to the conclusion that she had been arrested by the government on suspicion of being a political agent with designs on the peace of the country in this she was right and the officer thought that he had made an important capture it was to no purpose that she gave her name and nationality together with an account of her recent movements she was told that she must remain a prisoner till her baggage could be sent for from the caravan and the truth of her statement proved from her papers there was no help for it and she was compelled to spend the night upon a wooden bench in that miserable room without covering or food worn out with fatigue and excitement as she was she could not sleep and when in desperation she tried to find some relief by walking up and down her prison the cossack rushed in and led her back to the bench at the same time giving her to understand that she must not move in the morning her baggage arrived and she was set at liberty as there was no means of obtaining redress she continued her homeward journey without delay travelling by way of constantinople and athens on the fourth of november eighteen forty eight she arrived in vienna after an absence of two years and a half during which she had undergone an amount of peril and hardship almost incredible for a woman and by her personal enterprise made no mean addition to the cause of knowledge End of chapter two Chapter three of Heroines of Travel by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Rockies. 
in reading the story of miss bird's adventures in the rocky mountains we find it difficult to realize that the writer of these stirring pages is a woman indeed there are many men who would not have cared to face the difficulties and dangers which this distinguished woman traveller cheerfully encountered to satisfy her love of travel picture to yourself the accommodation for visitors at a house in the wilderness where she stayed for some time there was no table no bed no basin no towel no glass no window no fastening on the door there were holes in the roof the logs were unchinked and one end of the cabin was partially removed the charge for board and lodging was twenty-five shillings a week with the proviso that the lodger would make herself agreeable this she tried to do but her advances were met in such a dubious fashion that she was not over sanguine about the result nor was it easy to fall asleep with wolves rummaging under the floors and now and then a fox or a skunk rushing in at the open end of the cabin and making as speedy an exit through the unglazed window or seeing the head of a snake thrust up through a chink in the floor this was in colorado where the climate is one of the finest in the world and people can safely sleep out of doors for six months in the year the only objection the lady had to sleeping in the open was the presence of reptiles they seemed to be everywhere rattlesnakes and moccasin snakes both deadly carpet snakes and green racers reputed dangerous water snakes tree snakes and mouse snakes harmless but abominable the first few days after she put up at this place seven rattlesnakes were destroyed one that she herself had killed had a rattle of eleven joints having bought a young bronco mare miss bird attempted to mount her purchase no sooner did she touch the saddle than the animal leaped over a heap of timber the girth gave way and the would-be rider fell over the mare's tail receiving at the same time a parting kick on her knee though badly bruised miss bird had no bones broken cold water dressings she thought would soon put matters right especially as circumstances did not admit of making a fuss indeed she was much more anxious about the rents in her riding dress than the cuts and bruises on almost every part of her body shortly before her arrival in this region long's peak the american matterhorn as it is sometimes called had been ascended for the first time it is nearly fifteen thousand feet high anxious to enjoy the view from the summit the traveller arranged with mountain jim to guide her to the top this man was one of those famous scouts of the plains of whom so much was heard in the days of the indian frontier warfare a desperate character yet not without some noble traits when his sober said the settler who recommended him to miss bird jim's a perfect gentleman but when he's had liquor he's the most awful ruffian in colorado together the unarmed lady traveller and the desperado armed to the teeth with knife and revolver axe and rifle set out the climb to the summit was of the most exciting description and but for the assistance of her companion the lady could not have accomplished her purpose in some parts she had to be hauled up like a bale of goods slipping faltering gasping for breath she still mounted upwards 
until, crawling on hands and knees, the peak was won at last. The intrepid lady stood on the summit of this mountain, the lonely sentinel of the rocky range, from whence she could see the waters start for the eastern and western oceans. Here she witnessed a magnificent sunrise. At first as a dazzling streak, but enlarging rapidly into a dazzling sphere, the sun wheeled above the grey line, a light and glory as when it was first created. Jim involuntarily and reverently uncovered his head and exclaimed, I believe there is a God. The descent was even more perilous than the ascent, and Miss Bird with difficulty kept her feet. Again and again she fell. Once she hung on to a ledge of rock by her dress, and the garment had to be cut away with Jim's hunting knife. Fortunately, she fell into a crevice of soft snow and escaped with a few bruises. So exhausted was she when the first resting place was reached that she had to be carried, wrapped in blankets, to the camping ground. There, with the guide's dog lying by her side, she lay for hours looking up at the beloved stars of her far-off home. Her lonely rides for days together show that, like Nelson, she did not know what fear was. At that time, only twenty years ago, there were bands of bloodthirsty Indians and lawless white men who regarded the far west as their legitimate hunting ground, and who would as soon shoot a man as a bear. Dark stories of robbery and murder met Miss Bird at every stage of her journey, but she passed unmolested through all. Everywhere she found that the men had a habit of respectful courtesy to women, which she scarcely expected to find in these regions. The owner of a shanty, who lent her a horse to visit the famous Donner Lake, said to her when she started for an evening ride, There's a bad breed of ruffians about, but the ugliest among them all won't touch you. There's nothing western folk admire so much as pluck in a woman. One night Miss Bird slept in a house in a mining place called Hall's Gulch. In the morning she was horrified to find a man hanging on a tree only a few paces from the door. He had been lynched just before her arrival, and such a deed of violence was so little thought of that all appearance of excitement had died away in a few hours. Certainly, says the traveller, had I known what a ghastly burden that tree bore, I would have encountered the ice and gloom of the gulch rather than have slept there. On another of her solitary rides, she was joined by a horseman who rode for many miles by her side. He was a handsome man, well mounted and exceptionally well armed, even for a country where every able-bodied man was a moving arsenal. He had a rifle laid across his saddle, a pair of pistols in the holsters, two revolvers and a knife in his belt, and a carbine slung behind him. As they rode along together, the stranger beguiled the way with stories of hunting and adventures, and had much to say about the cruelty and treachery of the Indians. After a brief rest at a cabin for refreshments, they remounted and rode to the crest of the Continental Divide, from which a magnificent view of the surrounding country was obtained. Here Miss Bird said goodbye to the hunter, and returned to the cabin, where she asked the woman about her late companion. "'I'm sure you found Comanche Bill a real gentleman,' said the woman. 
then she found that the intelligent courteous man in whom she had been so much interested was one of the most notorious desperadoes of the rocky mountains and the greatest indian exterminator on the frontier some members of his family had been massacred in an indian raid and from that time he had shot down the red men wherever he could find them having spent all her money miss bird had to wait for supplies which she hoped would reach her in a few days with two young men both strangers to her she roughed it in a mountain cabin for nearly a month food was scarce for the ground was covered with snow and the cold very intense while the men hunted she kept house for them and made things as comfortable as was possible under the circumstances they had no sheets no towels and no tablecloths the beds were large bags filled with hay and the floor was two inches deep in mud at length miss bird determined to make an attempt to reach the plains i've seen many foolish people said one of her friends to her when she announced her departure but never one so foolish as you you haven't a grain of sense why i an old mountaineer wouldn't go down to the plains to-day having however made up her mind she was not to be turned aside even by such a warning and accordingly set out on what she calls her eerie ride followed by the protests of her friends the snow lay deep on every side and the surface was marked with the footprints of numerous birds and beasts without knowing it she crossed over many an ice bridge which spanned deep streams and she rode through gulches where a false step would have cost her her life high overhead the great mountain eagle sailed on the watch for his prey it was a fearful ride a snowstorm came on and the wind was loaded with fine hard crystals which literally cut her face and made the blood flow once her pony carried her on to a lake and fell through the ice into the water it was a hard struggle to get back again to land the cold brought tears into her eyes and the moisture quickly froze closing the eyelids so that she could scarcely see her way when at length she reached longmount her destination she had to be lifted off her horse and carried into the hotel there hot drinks and warm blankets soon restored life to her benumbed limbs and she seemed little the worse for her daring ride the dangers through which she passed may be estimated from a remark made by the landlord to his wife just before miss bird arrived he said if there's a traveller on the prairie to-night god help him at this hotel she found the person who had charge of her money storm-bound and on the following day she set out again with two companions she rode fifteen miles and then stopped at a ranch for a short rest hearing that she was going on the trapper exclaimed what that woman going into the mountains alone she'll lose the track or be froze to death when however she told him she had ridden in the storm two days before and not lost her way and had travelled over six hundred miles alone in the mountains he treated her with great respect as a fellow mountaineer when she departed he gave her some matches saying you'll have to camp anyhow and you'd better make a fire than be froze to death returning after her wanderings to the mountain cabin miss bird prepared for her final departure from the rockies 
she was loath to go and the friends she had made in the wilds of the west were reluctant to part with one whose influence for good upon their rough natures and abandoned lives had been truly remarkable at length she said good-bye and turned her horse's head towards the east mountain jim rode with her part of the way and in that last interview told her that bad as he was he never lay down to sleep without prayer prayer chiefly that god would give him a happy death together they stayed at a small inn at st louis when the landlady heard who miss bird's companion was she expressed unbounded astonishment that quiet kind gentleman rocky mountain jim she exclaimed why i have frightened the children by telling them that if they were naughty he would carry them off nor could she believe that a man of so pleasing a bearing could be guilty of the misdeeds attributed to him before parting with her trusty guide miss bird pleaded with him to give up his drinking habits and lead a better life it might have been once he replied sadly but now it is too late too late the traveller's influence however prevailed in the end and jim promised to reform his life but it was indeed too late a few months later a dreadful tragedy was enacted among the mountains and jim fell shot by a man with whom he had long been on friendly terms when they had parted and as miss bird was driving away she looked back and her heart was filled with mingled feelings of pleasure and regret she says i never realized that my rocky mountain life was at an end not even when i saw mountain jim his golden hair yellow in the sunshine leading the beautiful mare over the snowy plains equipped with the saddle on which i had ridden eight hundred miles End of chapter 3「4. Of Heroines of Travel by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the Himalayas. Miss Gordon Cummings' surroundings, the first morning after her arrival in India, were suggestive of a scene out of the Arabian Nights. Her bedroom well answered to the description which someone had given of an Indian bedroom. A section of the street with a bed in it. From five o'clock in the morning, dark-skinned servants, all men, flitted in and out of the room, bringing lamps, water, tea, fruit, and various other articles. These masculine apparitions were exceedingly bewildering and it took some time before the traveller could look on them as mere lay figures, whose sole purpose in life was to wait her goodwill and pleasure. Even in Calcutta, the city of palaces, a visitor has not far to go to see native life in all its simplicity. Miss Cumming found that, behind the luxurious houses of the merchant princes lay the black town where the natives lived in narrow dingy alleys their houses consisting of huts of baked mud or twisted bamboo here all but naked the people sit on the ground and bask in the sun no more interesting sight can be seen than that described by Miss Cumming when, as she says, it seems as if the whole population had turned out of their houses to perform their toilet in public. The cleansing of the mouth on awakening in the morning is a religious ceremony. 
every hindu is especially careful about his teeth which he polishes vigorously with a soft flat stick about the width of his finger she also noticed the barbers at work in the streets and the painting of those curious lines and marks on the forehead which distinguish the different hindu sects these marks consist of spots circles straight lines curved lines alone or arranged in different designs and varied colours what the lady calls the antagonism of brown and white skins struck her very disagreeably for instance at table her friends would not allow her to sit next to a well-dressed native simply because he was a native europeans refused to ride in the railway carriages with natives and in other ways the lack of sympathy between all shades of colour was shown before leaving calcutta the traveller had to lay in a supply of bedding as she was informed that neither at hotels nor friends houses was there provided for guests anything but a rude wooden bedstead the bed and the bedclothes like personal clothing were supposed to be part of the visitor's luggage having crossed the river by steamboat miss cumming made her way to the railway station which was thronged with natives to them the punctuality of trains was a matter of great surprise in their dread of being late it was not at all unusual for them to assemble at the stations hours before the time of starting sometimes overnight having their beds with them they laid themselves down on the pavement where wrapped up tightly they looked like rows of corpses laid out to order the railway carriages were labelled separately for natives native women and europeans as many of the journeys were for long distances most of the carriages were so arranged that at night each compartment could be made into sleeping quarters for four persons the roofs were double and the windows had projecting shades to keep off the sun in the hot season many persons are stricken down by the heat while travelling and miss cumming was told that coffins were kept at every station to be ready for any fatalities at morshedabad the traveller left the train and crossed the ganges in an open boat here in the bright moonlight she saw numerous fires on the steep banks of the stream groups of wild-looking creatures sat around them they were mourners in attendance at the funeral pyres of their friends after spending the night at a friend's house miss cumming took a trip on the ganges and to her dismay saw dead hindus floating past these were the bodies of persons whose relatives were too poor to provide for them a funeral pyre the banks of the stream were lined with vultures jackals and other animals all eager to share in any portion of human flesh that drifted ashore at allahabad the traveller lived for the first time in a real indian bungalow with high thatched roof and pillared veranda the ceiling was merely a sheet of canvas along which could be seen running little feet of lizards squirrels and other creatures the household pests however which were most dreaded were white ants these little insects move about in armies and working swiftly and silently destroy everything they come across the destruction of books and papers is very annoying a tradesman told miss cumming that he had received a large supply of english goods one day and unpacked them in the evening on the following morning they lay on the ground literally reduced to powder 
she also saw beams in buildings which appeared to be of good strong timber but which crumbled at a touch the inside had been eaten away by ants who have such a strong dislike to the light that they rarely touch the outer surface the little grey squirrels which made their homes in every corner were seen darting about even more fearlessly than a half-starved english robin on a winter's day their impudence says miss cumming knows no bounds i have seen them carry off bread from a child's hand if she chanced to turn her head the other way to the great amazement of the poor wee woman one of her pleasantest afternoons spent in this city was in watching the native cavalry who were exceedingly expert in tent pegging picking rings off poles with their long spears while riding at full gallop cleaving oranges with swords and so forth mounted on tall elephants miss cumming and her friends devoted a day to visiting the holy fair at allahabad she says that the noises were positively bewildering the deafening clamours for backsheesh the incessant beating of tom-toms and other discordant instruments the cries of conjurers and jugglers and of itinerant merchants of all sorts the angry growling of many camels the neighing of horses lowing of bullocks and occasionally the shrill trumpeting of an elephant mingling with the amazing roar of multitudinous human voices all combining to produce one general hubbub was overpowering and at last we left the scene with a sense of thankful relief at Kaunpur, the lady ploughed her way from the railway station to her bungalow through seas of white dust the cause lay in the crumbling of the limestone of the district under the action of sun and rain and heavy traffic the wind caused it to rise and fill the air with suffocating clouds no sandstorm in the desert was ever more penetrating the spot where the terrible massacre of Kaunpur took place had a great fascination for the visitor, who was never tired of wandering along the banks of the sacred river. There were the steps, or gouts, where so many British were done to death, and the bungalow from whence the monster, Nana Sahib, watched the scene of destruction, while nearby was the monument which informed the passer-by that there a great company of christian people had been murdered at lucknow miss cumming visited some of the places of interest in the company of one who had been present at the mutiny he described the deeds of valour performed by british soldiers and sailors as almost incredible from the tomb of sir henry hevelock they passed to the residency whose battered ruins even then bore the mark of the shot and shell which poured in such fierce tempests on the walls with interest the lady looked on the tower where the flag of england floated during those five awful months and it seemed almost impossible that the place could have been held for so long a time by the little garrison against such overwhelming odds when miss cumming arrived at agra she was unable to find words to express her delight when her eyes first fell on that fairy-like snowy palace among tombs the taj mahal to her it seemed a mere folly to attempt either by words or pictures to convey the faintest impression of the beauty of this marvellous structure she speaks of it a cluster of pearly snow-white domes nestling round one grand central dome like a gigantic pearl these crowning a building all of purest highly polished marble so perfect in its proportions 
so lovely in its design so simply restful to the eye and withal so amazingly intricate in its simplicity that it is in truth more like some strange dream in marble than like the work of human hands in a chamber below this the grandest tomb in the world the emperor shah jahan buried his young and beloved wife that he might honour her memory by such a monument as should fill the world with wonder that he succeeded in his purpose we know for while there are many costly and magnificent structures in the world there is but one taj mahal day after day during her stay at agra miss cumming went morning noon and night to gaze on this glorious building that she might enjoy the view in every varying effect of light and shade struck by the numerous echoes which were heard even when speaking in low and subdued tones she tried the effect of singing a few lines of the hymn brief life is here our portion at once it seemed to her as if a chorus of spirit voices took up the strain and whispering the words again and again carried them away heavenward on the clouds of blue smoke that rose like incense from agra she proceeded to delhi which she describes as a dwelling-place of giants here she gazed with wonder on mighty mosques huge tombs with giant gateways enormous forts and a veritable world of ruins living in a tent outside the walls near the cashmere gate she wandered with her friends step by step over hard-fought ground recalling the brave deeds of daring in the terrible days of eighteen fifty seven beasts and birds of almost every species found refuge among those miles of ruins there were seen flocks of gorgeous wild peacocks green parrots and doves there too were herds of deer and game of all sorts and sizes great flights of white butterflies alighted on the bushes only to be preyed on by pretty pale green spiders yet in this paradise for sportsmen the traveller may wander alone the livelong day and never meet a human being it was at delhi that miss cumming witnessed some of the remarkable performances of the indian jugglers which strike strangers with wonder the snake charmers give exhibitions daily and the power they possess over these reptiles was seen in one instance when a snake which had been freely handled afterwards sprang at a young woman and bit her in the throat so that she died in half an hour at saharanpore miss cumming came in sight of the himalayas which at that distance appeared like little patches and peaks of glittering white here too she saw elephants in full dress their wise-looking faces were painted with lines stars stripes and various patterns in brilliant colours in their great ears were rich jewels while their huge ankles were circled with bangles of silver and precious stones costly jewels adorned their foreheads and the tips of their tusks were sheathed in gold and silver in the fantastic howdars on the backs of these gaily ornamented animals were indian chiefs and princes who had assembled to take part in a grand durbar these men literally glittered with gems never before says miss cumming had she seen such gorgeous embroidery such cloth of gold such jewels pearls diamonds and rubies as on that occasion when the morning came for the reception of the emir of afghanistan by lord mayo who was at that time viceroy of india 
his highness did not appear it seems that he had unfortunately eaten a whole bottle of pickles and drunk the vinegar and it took him some hours to recover from the effect of this unusual repast the lady however had the pleasure of seeing the emir in the afternoon when she says he looked decidedly ill the conversation between the viceroy and the emir was carried on through an interpreter and we can scarcely wonder that lord mayo had some difficulty to repress a smile when in reply to his inquiry whether all arrangements had been made for his comfort the emir replied that since entering british territory his stomach had been full the queen's presents to the emir were both numerous and valuable those however which seemed to give the afghan monarch the greatest satisfaction were the guns and pistols and a whole battery of artillery when the ceremony was over and the viceroy had himself escorted the emir to the door and he had received his salute of twenty-one guns each raja was in turn handed out and in turn saluted by the number of guns to which he was entitled by his rank it is scarcely possible says miss cumming for an englishman to realise what immense importance the natives attach to these minute distinctions or how immeasurable is the distance between the man who ranks as a five-gun raja and he who is entitled to fifteen she next made a trip to simla the hill station on the slopes of the himalayas to which many of the indian officials go during the hot season the journey was made part of the way by dak or post gary a kind of box on wheels in which the traveller lies at full length from kelka the travellers were obliged to ride or be carried by coolies in a kind of sedan chair the bearers proceeding at the rate of about fourteen miles a day simla was somewhat disappointing in that it seemed to be so far away from the chief heights of the himalayas away far away in the distant horizon fully one hundred miles from simla could be seen a long narrow line indented like the teeth of a saw that is the snowy range in which there are hundreds of summits more than twenty thousand feet high there too in all its majesty is mount everest the loftiest height on the face of the globe at simla miss cumming saw numerous monkeys in fact she says that they are legion both the common and brown ones which come careering all over the houses and the great big grey ones with black face and paws and fringe of white hair round the forehead climbing the trees near the houses the monkeys entered open windows and freely helped themselves to any food within their reach when lady barker gave her first dinner party at simla the dining-room was left in charge of native servants after the table had been laid and decorated with choice ornaments when the mistress returned she found the room full of jabbering monkeys their cheeks and arms loaded with expensive sweetmeats while the table presented a scene of the utmost confusion the beautiful glass and china dishes and figures were broken and the display completely ruined it seems that the servants had gone off to enjoy a quiet smoke giving the monkeys the opportunity for which they were waiting from simla the road to tibet was taken by the small party of european travellers their luggage being carried by coolies who walked in line as the safest plan on those narrow precipitous paths miss cumming much preferred these human ponies to quadrupeds 
as horses sometimes refused to stir or backed or slipped in dangerous places causing frightful accidents in mahasso forest the travellers witnessed a gathering of all the wild hill tribes the women were present in large numbers and the weight of ornaments they wore was excessive ears nose hair arms and ankles were all decorated and many of the necklaces and anklets were made of glass stone or bell metal the ornaments of one damsel could not have been less than thirty pounds in weight in these she walked long distances over the mountains and danced all night day after day the party ascended higher and higher carefully picking their way along the ledges of rocks which were the only paths and crossing ravines and rivers by rude bridges made of tree trunks fastened together with ropes of grass at length they reached the mountain villages in the cliffs above the cunivar valley where they came upon tribes having many strange customs never met with in more frequented parts of the world here miss cummings saw the yak the ox of tibet a short thick-set creature covered from nose to tail with long shaggy hair living on scanty fare strong and sure-footed this animal is an invaluable beast of burden and is able to carry heavy loads across otherwise inaccessible passes it is so truly a native of the mountains that it does not thrive at a lower level than nine thousand feet this curious cow she says with a horse's tail and sheep's wool combines the properties of all three animals it finds its own scanty food yet gives the richest milk to the plough it brings the strength of an ox it clothes its master in silky and abundant wool while to beef-eating people it would also supply meat and leather more sure-footed than the surest pony it carries its load or its rider along pathless mountains and is most at home on the highest passes a peep into chinese tartary brought miss cummings indian journey to an end on the borders of the indian and chinese empires she entered the country of the lamas and saw some of the customs of the worshippers of buddha the prayer wheels of the natives interested her greatly and she tried in vain to buy one which was beautifully carved and inlaid with precious stones reluctantly the wanderers were at length obliged to return it was with unutterable regret says miss cumming and many a backward look towards all the unexplored beauty we were about to leave more especially that lovely group of peaks up the valley that we were forced to bid adieu to beautiful rarung and turn once more to civilization End of chapter 4chapter five of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain fire and storm the sunbeam the yacht in which lady brassey made her famous voyages was on its way from the river plate to the straits of magellan when great excitement was caused on board by the sight of a ship on fire hastily summoned to witness the disaster lady brassey rushed on deck and found that the people on the sunbeam were looking at a large bark under full sail flying the red union jack upside down she also showed other signals which mean ship on fire then another signal was hoisted asking for immediate help the request was promptly complied with 
and a boat was launched not seeing an appearance of fire the boat's crew were well armed to be ready to assist the officers if instead of fire they found that a mutiny had broken out on board the stranger in a few minutes the boat returned and brought the information that fire had been discovered several days before but that the crew had not been able to get at it the vessel was the monkshaven of whitby laden with coal for valparaiso to prevent the flame spreading the crew had battened down the hatches and having thrown overboard all such combustible articles as tar oil paint spare sails and spars had lived on deck under a canvas screen lord brassey and captain brown of the sunbeam went on board the monk's haven and found the deck more than a foot deep in water the hatches were then opened and at once a volume of dense smoke burst forth from the captain's cabin came suffocating fumes of poisonous gas and when one man attempted to enter the room he fell down insensible as it was hopeless to try to save the vessel the officers decided to abandon her and the work of transferring the crew from the bark to the yacht began this was safely accomplished in three trips the poor fellows says lady brassey were almost wild with joy at getting alongside another ship after all the hardships they had gone through and in their excitement they threw overboard many things which they might as well have kept as they had taken the trouble to bring them from the deck of the sunbeam the flames were soon seen to mount higher and higher and the heat was so intense that it could be felt even in the cold night air on board the yacht the rescued sailors were very anxious to see the last of their vessel and they gathered in the rigging on the deck-house and on the bridge and watched her burn slowly down to the water's edge lady brassey was very much interested in the shipwrecked men and from them she learned that while they had declined the proffered assistance of an english vessel on the second day thinking they could run into port an american steamer two days later refused assistance and sailed away another said when we saw that ship sail away we all gave in and lay down in despair to die but our captain who is very good to his crew and a religious man too said there is one above who looks after us all that was true enough continued the sailor for ten minutes afterwards as i was talking to the cook and telling him it was all over with us i saw your sail to leeward and informed the captain the addition of fifteen persons to the yacht's crew was a serious matter for so small a vessel there was a fear that the provisions might run short and what was more alarming still the supply of water to guard against such a contingency as far as possible the crew were put on half an allowance and for washing purposes only sea water was used however in a few days a steamer hove in sight and as she was homeward bound the sunbeam signalled to her and on her the shipwrecked crew were safely conveyed to england proceeding on her way the sunbeam accomplished the dangerous passage through the straits of magellan and after a pleasant sail across the pacific she cast anchor in the japanese harbour of kobe after a short trip ashore lady brassey returned to the yacht when she went on board the vessel was rolling a good deal and in one of the passages leading to her cabin she slipped and fell 
her thumb caught in the hinge of an open door which was banged to by the returning roll of the yacht and the member was very badly crushed the operation of dressing the wound was so painful that she fainted and had to be carried to bed as luck would have it that very evening soon after midnight she was awakened by that most terrible of all cries heard at sea the ship is on fire the sleeping draught which she had taken to soothe the pain in her thumb made her half stupid but exerting herself she made her way out of the cabin dense volumes of smoke were issuing from each side of the staircase and some of the crew were busy pouring water on the flames and removing all combustibles out of the way others were rigging up the hose and getting the extincters ready till these were in position the hatches were kept closely fastened and the suffocating atmosphere almost overpowered the workers this precaution was necessary for the seat of the fire had not yet been discovered and if it proved to be in the hold as was expected the admission of air might have caused the total destruction of the yacht when all was in readiness the floors were taken up and the partitions pulled down where the fire seemed to be most active and in a short time the flames were got under then the hold and every part of the vessel was thoroughly searched the only damage done was to the cabin floor which was burned through on inquiry it was found that the cold night had caused the servants to make a large fire in the nursery at bedtime it was raked out but the ash pan was not large enough to contain the hot cinders which fell on the tiles and made them red hot and this ignited the woodwork about four o'clock the sunbeam weighed anchor and proceeded to hong kong an officer of the flagship went on board and piloted her to a berth among the men of war as soon as the yacht fixed her moorings she was surrounded by sampans or native boats and crowds of chinese flocked on board to sell their wares such a nuisance did these native vendors at length become that they were ordered to quit the ship but they paid no heed and continued their trade as before they swarmed everywhere and it almost seemed as if they had some other object in view than trade at last the captain ordered the hose to be turned on them this was done and a copious shower of water soon cleared every part of the vessel after this they were not bothered any more probably one of the worst storms the sunbeam ever encountered was in the north atlantic the vessel was hove to with topmasts housed everything battened down canvas tightly lashed over all doors and skylights and openings of every kind boats and spare sails covered with canvas were firmly secured to the deck when all had been made as safe as possible there was nothing for the crew to do but watch the wind and weather and hope for the best as it was dark and cheerless below lady brassey crawled up on deck and was astonished to find it free from water nor was there a leak anywhere the violence of the gale was such however that in one of the sudden lurches all the watch were pitched from one side of the deck to the other they were very much bruised and one of the men was badly injured lashed to a seat and well wrapped in her mackintosh lady brassey enjoyed the magnificent sight which she describes as terribly grand and almost awful the huge waves rose high overhead threatening every moment to engulf them the sunbeam 
as if aware of the danger seemed to dodge one wave and rise on the top of the next shaking herself like a newfoundland dog bless you ma'am said one of the sailors to whom she had praised the gallant little vessel why she's that sense that she'd lay herself to the beauty if you give her a chance before retiring to rest that night lady brassey peeped through a chink in the companion to take a last long lingering look around i could not help wondering she says with a feeling of awe and mixed with fear whether it would please a merciful providence to bring us safely to the light of another day or whether before morning the one vast problem that more than any other concerns all men the great mystery of life and death time and eternity would be solved for us at last the gale continued for several days and in one heavy squall a man was nearly lost overboard the rope on which he was standing gave way just as the sunbeam made a deep dip in the sea three times was the poor fellow submerged and his comrades gave him up for lost at length they managed to lay hold of him and pull him on board although much bruised and battered he was yet saved as from the very jaws of death before the wind moderated another terrible squall struck the yacht so suddenly and with such tremendous force that she seemed to be beaten down into the sea never before had lady brassey experienced the sensation she then felt the force of the wind completely took away her breath and she felt as if she was being driven through the deck the after leech of the mainsail burst with a report like a cannon and then split across with further reports and detonations as the wind rent through cloth after cloth with a noise like very heavy sharp shooting the shackle of the standing jibboom was carried away and came down with a crash and the deck was so hampered with rigging and canvas and there was such a flapping of sails rattling of blocks knocking of ropes howling of the tempest hissing of rain and roaring of the sea that for the next few moments nobody quite realized or knew exactly what had happened on the following day the wind calmed down the sun shone as bright and beautiful as ever the gale was over and the yacht continued on her voyage End of chapter five chapter six of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain peril and adventure in asia minor mrs scott stevenson the author of our home in cyprus had long cherished a wish to visit asia minor when at length her husband captain scott stevenson proposed that they should undertake a ride through that part of the turkish empire she had been warned by her friends that the journey would entail much fatigue and many privations that the people were fanatical and barbarous that a european lady had never been seen in these countries that she would be robbed or taken captive and in short that there was little hope of her or her husband returning alive from such an expedition landing at alexandretta on the gulf of scandaroon they set out on the caravan road to aleppo and plunging into the country soon left behind the accommodation for travellers generally found on the coast and in large towns mrs stevenson's first introduction to a khan the only substitute for an inn throughout asia minor 
is thus described she had been informed that the pasha's room would be at her disposal judge of my dismay she writes when i entered the place to find nothing but four unplastered walls with three windows without either glass or shutters but only wooden bars to keep out robbers no fireplace and but a few grass mats laid on the floor such was the pasha's room so called because the other apartments were mere cells without a window the travellers at first thought that it would be impossible to sleep in such an unfurnished place but there was no choice wisely concluding that as they would have to rough it the sooner they began the better they made up beds with blankets and other clothing and with their saddles for pillows settled down for the night on the following morning they were in some doubt which road to take especially as they were informed that the mountains on every side had a very bad reputation for brigands it was thought however that the mountain robbers would be afraid to attack them unless they travelled in the night as so many of them had recently been killed the travellers decided to take the shortest road they were much interested in the numerous caravans which they met coming from aleppo strings of camels were seen with huge bales fastened on either side these were bactrian camels with two humps long bodies and short legs the drivers in long mantles sandals and turbans could not repress an exclamation of astonishment when they saw a lady riding on a side saddle having to cross a river on the banks of which a tribe of wild-looking bedouins were encamped they decided to ford the chocolate-coloured stream mrs stevenson's pony was too small to cross with her on its back so she was hoisted on to the shoulders of a sturdy arab bravely he entered the water but he had not gone far when stepping into a hole they both went down together i shall never forget says the traveller as long as i live the feeling of the muddy water as it rushed over me in a second i had scrambled out of course to the same side i had started from and was seated on the grass with the water pouring literally in streams from my saturated garments a horse was then brought and on this she crossed in safety having no means of changing her wet clothes she had to run about in the sun until they were sufficiently dried for her to continue the journey she was glad when they reached their resting place for the night where they found a large number of persons belonging to different caravans and camped hundreds of fires had been lighted and around them were kurds arabs bedouins and turkomans who had a wild uncouth look and who stared surlily at the newcomers as they passed on to the calm though very tired the travellers were kept awake during the greater part of the night by the discharge of firearms this was the plan adopted by the people of the caravans that robbers might know they were awake and ready to defend any attack that might be made on their cattle or merchandise rising while it was yet dark the horses were saddled by candlelight and at four o'clock in the morning they were once more on the way their stay in aleppo was spent very pleasantly the officials paying them many attentions thence they set out for Killis. the weather was very cold and in spite of her wraps mrs stevenson was obliged to get off her horse from time to time and run by the animal's side to warm her feet and keep up a semblance of circulation 
four hours from aleppo they reached a curious village which consisted of about a thousand hive-shaped houses grouped at the base of a low hill the owner of the khan was a very cautious arab who refused to supply the travellers with food for themselves and their horses until he had been paid in advance their journey through the lion pass over the mountains from asia minor to northern syria was very trying as they had to spend sixteen hours in the saddle before reaching their stopping place for the night before they arrived the sun had set and mrs stevenson was so exhausted that she could scarcely retain her seat on her horse during the last two hours she slept most of the way only waking up with a sudden start now and then as the howl of wolves and the plaintive cry of the jackal sounded unpleasantly near with a feeling of thankfulness she says she rolled rather than jumped off her horse when they came to the khan and was very soon fast asleep on the following day they made a halt at a Turkoman village where they were very sullenly received the men were all thieves and cattle stealers they were always ready to resort to violence and had no scruples about killing anyone who resisted them the travellers were very careful to avoid having any dispute with such dangerous characters and were glad to get away from them without molestation nearer adana in the worst part of the road the travellers met a cavalcade of circassians the leader unwilling to allow them to pass pushed straight on and mrs stevenson's horse was thrust off the path on to the ploughed ground while the man jeered at them in the most insulting manner very angry mrs stevenson cried out in turkish circassian savages when the english come you will all be sent back to your own country in chains on hearing this they gathered round in a most threatening manner fortunately says the lady our fearlessness had its effect for though they used no end of bad words and threatening gestures they passed slowly on leaving us in possession of the pathway i declare she continues that even if they had shot at me nothing could have induced me to have got out of the way for them when the travellers related the story to the english consul at adana he said it was a marvel that the circassians had not fired on them he told them that in one instance a circassian had cut off a peasant's nose because the unfortunate man had not removed his donkey quickly enough out of the way the road to kaiserera was found to be one of the worst they had yet come across about every thirty yards they saw the half-eaten carcass or skeleton of a horse or camel surrounded by vultures which had so gorged themselves that they might have been easily killed in fact many of these fierce birds seemed to be unable to move from their carrion feast the keeper of the khan at mesaluk was a zabek who had belonged to a robber band which had been broken up many of these questionable characters were met with they were known by their dress which seldom varied they were well armed carrying usually four pistols and five knives of different sizes though pressed to stay here the travellers pushed on to the khan at sarichek this was a general rendezvous and there were thousands of men horses and mules resting on the ground in this place women were so rarely seen that the appearance of the english lady struck the members of the various caravans dumb with surprise they gathered in crowds simply to obtain a peep at such a rarity 
and the attendants of the europeans were regarded as men of importance they were surrounded by an interesting crowd eager to hear who and what the strangers were their path now lay away from the beaten track and through a district where there were neither villages nor guard houses the mountain passes were infested with robbers and even the ordinary natives were ready to make an honest penny by appropriating anything they could steal in a quiet way the attendants in despair begged the travellers to change their route mrs stevenson told them to look at her and see how brave she was she also told them that her husband could kill twenty robbers somewhat reassured the men started and soon afterwards they found a guide who said he was well acquainted with the proposed route at the various stopping places all along the road the stories of the robbers were repeated but none of these desperate characters put in an appearance the guide however was rather a tricky customer after some hours march they found that he was leading them into a perfect wilderness a herdsman whom they met informed them that they were going in a direction opposite to their destination and making straight for the mountains which were full of robbers indeed the people who lived in the villages had been obliged to seek homes elsewhere because the brigands stole their cattle and robbed their houses there can be little doubt that the intention was to waylay and murder the travellers for the false guide disappeared and was not seen again after leaving kara hissar where they were again warned of the presence of brigands in the neighbourhood they were met in a lonely place by two suspicious-looking men who rode down upon them mrs stevenson had promised her husband that if any such difficulty arose she would as far as possible keep out of his way and leave him to act she felt that such a moment had come and therefore remained in the background without a moment's hesitation captain stevenson rode to meet them pistol in hand they were not prepared for such active measures and after wavering for a moment they wheeled round and galloped off as fast as they could one of them fired his gun as he went but the shot went wide of the mark oh said this plucky lady how i longed to be a man to join in the chase as they passed near her in their headlong flight she could not refrain from calling out kordak meaning coward one of the men glared at her and the second raised his gun and fired he also called out something but he was riding too fast for her to hear what he said soon afterwards the travellers arrived at a station where there were soldiers and the sergeant promised to send some of his men in pursuit of the robbers there was little likelihood however of him moving a finger in the matter two days were spent in the armenian city of caesarea and then the journey was continued in an araba or wagon in a very dangerous part of the road the driver lost his way and as it was rather hilly the travellers got out to walk it was well they did so for the man attempted to drive down a precipice the horses lost their footing and gave one long plunge breaking the pole and splinter bars and dashing headlong down the cliff the wagon bounded into the air and turned completely over the driver gave one shriek allah and in a second lay senseless and bleeding the travellers rushed to his assistance and applied such restoratives as they had at hand but they saw that he was very seriously injured 
the attendant was sent off to the next village for a vehicle while captain and mrs stevenson remained with the driver as the man did not return and night was fast approaching the captain determined to go and look for him making his wife as comfortable as possible and giving her his pistol in case she needed to defend herself he mounted one of the horses and rode off it was a terrible situation for an englishwoman to be placed in alone in that wild region with an apparently dying man the intense silence was only broken by the moans which now and again issued from his lips the heat was almost overpowering and she was parched with thirst once she looked up and saw a man on horseback peering down on her from the rock above but when she pointed the pistol at him he moved off then a string of mules appeared in charge of two turks who in spite of the lady's imploring signs for help rode on as fast as they could five hours of suspense passed and then she heard her husband's voice calling her and she burst into tears of thankfulness he had brought assistance men and camels had been obtained and the lady and the injured driver were conveyed to the village here the poor fellow received the best attention they could command and before leaving him a present of money was made to pay for the damage done to his araba soon afterwards he recovered from the effects of his fearful fall and with a new wagon was once more ready to ply his calling the traveller's visit to conia was full of interest as they were allowed to see the dervishes in their own college this was an exceptional favour as the sheikh was afraid that the presence of a woman might be strongly resented mrs stevenson's pleading had proved successful in the end never before she declares had she seen such a heap of riches which positively dazzled the beholder while the carpets put into shade the most beautiful of those she had seen in the bazaars of the chief cities of turkey in asia for the benefit of the visitors the dervishes perform the dance for which they are famous and which with them is a religious ceremony the curious movements of the dancers were very amusing to the strangers but they were careful not even to smile for they knew that at least a hundred eyes were fixed sternly on them watching for the least sign of levity the kindly treatment they experienced at conia was much appreciated by the travellers in no part of their journey had they suffered less inconvenience than here in the very heart of asia minor in a town filled with the most bigoted of Muslims and containing the fiercest devotees among the dervishes. Mrs. Stevenson says, We were greatly struck with the natural politeness of the people. I will ever look back with unalloyed pleasure on our stay in Konia. Leaving this place, the travellers made their way homeward by easy marches and at length reached Kyrenia, their home in Cyprus, in safety. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Heroines of Travel by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In South Africa lady barker's record of her experiences in south africa some years ago is full of interest wishing to travel one day from maritzburg to durban lady barker secured a seat in the postcart and set out as she says packed so tightly on the coach box that she had the mail bags under her feet and the driver's elbows in her ribs 
the horses were gaunt-looking animals ill-favoured and ill-groomed but all in good condition and able to do their work in first-rate style each had a name and these were generally those of well-known public characters which sounded somewhat oddly under the circumstances did we come says lady barker to a steep hillside up which any respectable english horse would expect to walk in a leisurely and sober fashion then our driver shook out his reins blew a shrill blast on his bugle and cried walk along lord gifford think as you've got another victoria cross to get top of this hill walk along lord carnarvon you ain't sitting in a cabinet council here you know don't leave sir garnet to do all the work forward my lucky lads creep up it she was somewhat startled to hear the driver suddenly exclaim walk along lady barker i'm ashamed of you i am hanging your head like that at a bit of a hill but when she remembered that the words were addressed to a very hard-working little brown mare she could only laugh and feel flattered that she had such a worthy namesake lady barker's neighbours near her south african home were natives and not by any means desirable acquaintances their homes were native kraals each of which consisted of about half a dozen large huts shaped like beehives the ground round about was roughly scratched by the women with crooked hoes to form a mealy ground cows mealies tobacco and blankets are all the natives require their pipe is usually a cow's horn when a chief appeared in public he was attired in a motley garb of old regimentals his head legs and feet quite bare riding on a sorry nag with the point of his great toe resting in the stirrup he was followed by the chief men carrying sticks and behind them came some of their wives bearing heavy loads on their heads and often with a young child on their backs they looked healthy happy and jolly and they were all insufferably lazy lady barker had often heard of serpents being caught in the neighbourhood but had never seen one until one day wishing to see if the baby was asleep she tried to peep into the nursery but found something pressing against the door on the inside with some difficulty she opened it sufficiently to see the head of a large snake held up in the air with the forked tongue out she at once called a kaffir servant named jack who obtained a stick while his mistress armed herself with a riding whip and together they dispatched the dangerous intruder after that everybody went about for some days in fear of meeting with another snake cupboards and all recesses were carefully searched and the boots were always looked into before being put on several snakes were found quite close to the house but no more were discovered inside frogs were very numerous and hopped in and out at will often startling the inmates by appearing in the dark and giving the impression that another snake was there one day a wagon came in with two adventurers who had made an expedition into the bush and brought back a goodly pile of skins and a large quantity of magnificent horns of all sizes the chief trophy however was a lion skin the animal had been shot while endeavouring to stalk the only donkey in the camp lions says lady barker can resist anything except ass flesh it appears but it is so entirely their favourite delicacy that they forget their cunning 
and become absolutely reckless in pursuit of it there is nothing the kaffirs prize more highly than the fat of the lion the head man of the expedition claimed this as his perquisite and having melted it down into gourds he sold it in small quantities to the natives the wild animals which at one time were very numerous in all parts of south africa were being gradually driven farther and farther into the bush and it was no uncommon sight to see the pits with sharp stakes at the bottom dug to trap elephants whose bones still lay bleaching in the sun one hill station which lady barker frequently visited was often invaded by troops of baboons from the woods near when the mealies were ripe these troublesome animals literally swarmed over the place in small armies and carried off armfuls of cobs there was a regular system of warfare between the kaffirs and the baboons and lady barker was horrified to hear that on one occasion the angry natives had caught an old baboon leader skinned him alive and let him return to the woods as a warning to his fellow thieves End of chapter seven chapter eight of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain in the holy land a few years ago mrs george sumner with her husband and other members of her family made a pilgrimage to the holy land the story of that journey is told in a journal kept by the lady and afterwards published under the title of our holiday in the east after visiting jerusalem the party set out for jericho and the dead sea the bad government of the turk could not be more clearly proved than by the fact that travellers have to pay blackmail to the arabs to ensure their safety on payment of a certain sum a sheikh accompanied the party as a guarantee that the money had been paid he is thus described by mrs sumner the sheikh rode early into our camp on a little grey arab horse he was most picturesquely attired in a white shirt with long sleeves a garment of olive green thrown over his shoulders black embroidered waistcoat loose white trousers stuffed into high boots and a dead gold kaffir on his head bound round with a cord of camel's hair a couple of pistols in his sash and a scimitar by his side showed that he was ready for any emergency even in the route between jerusalem and jericho all the men they met seemed to be armed as if no man's life or property was safe every syrian had his gun slung over his shoulder a couple of pistols in his belt and a dirk or scimitar at his side even the shepherd boys were armed at the midday halting place the party was watched by about a dozen arabs armed with long guns one of these men was the father of the sheikh in charge of the travellers hanny the guide welcomed him with delight and kissed him with great effusion he then introduced him to the members of the party as a capital fellow the camp for the night was pitched close to the ruins of ancient jericho and in the evening a number of natives came from modern jericho and asked permission to perform their national dance for the amusement of the visitors the guide admitted that the proposed performance was not beautiful but shrugging his shoulders said they have their customs so permission was given mrs sumner was cautioned beforehand 
not to show any signs of fear no matter what she saw or heard and she afterwards admitted that the advice was not unnecessary for it was impossible to imagine anything more hideous wild and uncanny than even the appearance of their entertainers they looked like savages with their tattooed faces glaring eyes dark complexions and dishevelled hair the performance which took place by moonlight consisted of certain movements of the body and limbs to a low discordant chant the dancers clapping their hands to keep time suddenly the dancing of the women ended with a shrill cry and the men took their places brandishing their scimitars in fantastic fashion dangerously close to the heads of the travellers whom they wished to frighten but having been warned they showed no fear when the dancers had received the promised backsheesh they left apparently well satisfied on the following day jericho was visited and then the party turned their horses towards the dead sea on the way the sheik entertained them with an exhibition of desert horsemanship he executed a number of extraordinary manoeuvres galloping wildly first in one direction and then in another all the time brandishing his sword as if attacking or repelling an enemy suddenly a band of arab horsemen appeared on the scene and one of their number galloped up to the horsemen with wild and threatening gestures he held a pistol in his hand which he fired into the air when quite near and then recognizing hanny the guide shook hands with him he afterwards inquired who the travellers were and said that his threatening advance had been intended merely to frighten them this species of practical joke mrs sumner did not relish in such a place and it required a considerable effort to keep down an expression of natural alarm she says these incidents brought vividly to her mind the eastern proverb referred to in sir walter scott's talisman in the desert no man meets a friend the nearer the travellers came to the dead sea the more desolate the country became the sand was covered in some places with bitumen and salt and the whole surrounding plain was arid and dreary the dead sea itself though still and motionless looked very beautiful the intense silence had a most solemnizing effect the smell of the water was very disagreeable and its taste nauseous in the extreme salt bitter and burning fish which had been brought down by the river jordan were lying dead killed by the sulphur which impregnated the water mrs sumner bathed in the waters of the lake and such was its buoyancy that she was able to lie at full length and float without moving hand or foot she felt as safe from sinking as if she had been lying on her bed the guide told them that once when in charge of a party at that place two ladies bathed in the sea one of them managed somehow to lose her balance and swallowed so much water that she became unconscious hanny sprang in and brought her ashore restoratives were quickly applied but she suffered terribly from the effects of the poisonous water and for some hours her life was despaired of on the return journey the travellers were again intercepted by a band of arabs but were finally allowed to pass unmolested even the short road between bethlehem and jerusalem was not altogether safe not long before their visit 
a rich jew had been robbed and murdered on that road by an arab peasant on the way from bethel which they next visited they passed through the gorge known as the robber's spring as they climbed the rocky hill beyond this place they met a caravan of armed arabs one of them placed his camel across the path and scimitar in hand refused to allow them to pass hanny however insisted on going on and after a furious altercation the arab gave way and rode off muttering curses and imprecations against the travellers mrs sumner asked hanny if they would not be safer from attack if all the party carried arms but he replied that they were more secure without weapons of any kind then pointing to the pocket in which her husband carried his bible the guide said lady that is our best protection at singill near shiloh hanny warned the party to be very careful of their property as the place had an evil reputation the natives were in the habit of creeping out of their houses and robbing the tents of sleeping travellers often they simply introduced their hand under the tent curtain and carried off any article they could reach that the precaution was not unnecessary was proved by the fact that on the day after the sumner party left some travellers who encamped on the same spot were robbed of a considerable sum of money at nablus the ancient shechem the people who are chiefly mohammedan fanatics scowled fiercely at the travellers as they passed along they did not however dare to insult them openly that night the camp was watched by four turkish soldiers who kept up a series of signals all the time to show that they were alert and wakeful in this way carefully guarded and always on the watch for danger the travellers passed through the holy land and at length reached the coast in safety End of chapter 8chapter nine of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain a peep into central america some years ago mrs foote the wife of the british consul at greytown nicaragua accompanied her husband from that bustling little seaport to san salvador both of which are parts of Central America. The journey was made partly by water and partly by land. The discomforts and dangers which the travellers had to face kept them in a constant state of irritation and fear. The roads were almost impassable, and the native Indians had but an indifferent character for honesty indeed their respect for human life was of the slightest as was manifest from the wayside crosses which marked the places where unfortunate travellers had been murdered at one place an english captain while walking quietly along the road was pounced on by a dozen men who had been hiding in a wood near after cruelly hacking him with their bowie knives they robbed him and left him helpless and dying on the road there he was found shortly afterwards and only just before he expired in one part of the journey they found the mud getting deeper and deeper every moment so hoping to fare better they struck a bypath like most shortcuts it proved a long one in the end for they had not ridden far before they lost all trace of the road 
among grass as high as the horses heads they endeavoured in the fast-growing darkness to get back to the path at first this seemed hopeless and mrs foot had just proposed to her husband that they should remain where they were for the night when he decided to trust to the sagacity of the horses the animals were allowed to proceed in the direction which seemed best to them and in a little while the path was found in the meantime a storm such as we never see in this country had come on the rain fell in torrents and the thunder and lightning were terrific mrs foot's horse was so dreadfully alarmed by one awful flash and the deafening peal which succeeded it that it stopped and absolutely refused to stir another step her husband who was leading the way did not notice that she was not following him and though she called as loud as she could her voice was drowned by the wind and rain fortunately one flash of lightning more brilliant than the rest revealed her absence and immediately turning back he found her and her stubborn horse as neither coaxing nor spurring could induce the animal to move mr foot was obliged to dismount and lead both horses through a mass of mud and water the traveller's joy was great when they saw lights in the distance and found the men who should have guided them along a safe path and who had charge of their baggage comfortably seated round a roaring wood fire mr foot soundly rated them partly in english and partly in spanish for their indifference and they seemed more amused than alarmed at the deluged and angry state of their employers on arriving at san miguel the travellers rested for two days after their adventures then on the third day they set out again at one place mr foot bathed in a river which he found to be infested by alligators one of these immense reptiles was quite near to him before he became aware of its presence but luckily he managed to gain the bank in safety shortly after they reached san salvador the consul and his wife only escaped an awful fate by a seemingly accidental circumstance having to visit a neighbouring town on business they were so much pleased with the place that they prolonged their stay for several weeks then they received the terrible news that san salvador had been totally destroyed by an earthquake on the morning of the day which witnessed the disaster the inhabitants were alarmed by a severe shock which fortunately served as a warning to a number of persons who at once left their houses for the open country shortly afterwards a much more violent shock followed it lasted only ten seconds but so tremendous was the convulsion that when it had passed scarcely a building was left standing the grand cathedral with its massive walls three feet thick which had withstood many a previous earthquake was a heap of ruins the walls of baked earth of which the houses were built crumbled into dust and many persons were suffocated mrs foot expresses her inability to relate even a small proportion of the tales of horror which she heard from those who survived the terrors of that awful visitation she says husbands seeking their wives mothers their children many rushing about the streets confessing their sins aloud while priests raised the cross on high saying the day of judgment was come and several people died in the streets 
who had been sick or dying when the earthquake took place the loss of property was immense many being rendered penniless who were rich the day before everyone fled except robbers and those who valued their property more than their lives and hoped to save the wreck of their fortunes by digging beneath the ruins the home to which the consul removed was infested with centipedes scorpions and venomous spiders one night while asleep mrs foote received such a severe bite on one of her fingers that her whole hand became dreadfully swollen and the pain extended up to her shoulder yet the bite was no bigger than the point of a pin the injury was done by a pretty little crimson spider known to be very venomous a colony of which made themselves at home in the corridor another night she was aroused from sleep by the sound of feet on the matting to her horror she saw a huge spider emerge from beneath her wardrobe and was afraid that it would attack her remaining perfectly still she had the satisfaction of seeing the tarantula disappear without troubling her while visiting a mountain station for the benefit of her health mrs foote witnessed an eruption of the volcano of isalco she was awakened in the night by the strong smell of sulphur and on opening the outer door found that a thick shower of ashes was falling it appeared to her like a black snowstorm when day dawned the whole country was black with ashes the sky was enveloped in a dull lurid fog through which the sun in vain tried to pierce their throats were much affected by the sulphur and they began to fear that the tragedy of pompeii was about to be reenacted the eruption lasted for three days and so great was the fall of ashes that large fruit trees were broken down by the enormous weight many of the trees looked as if they had been half consumed by fire every blade of grass was scorched the crops were completely ruined and the cattle had to be driven some twenty miles to fresh pastures to the great consternation of the people the lava flowed within a mile of the town there however it stopped and the place was saved to the intense relief of the inhabitants mrs foote was much amused at the ingenious manner in which young children were carried on long journeys a sheet is knotted round the neck of the horseman in order to form a hammock a small pillow is placed inside and the babe lies as comfortably as if in its own cradle the jolting of the horse's movements being scarcely felt she also gives an amusing instance of indian superstition the natives being much impressed by omens on one occasion a european traveller was about to start on a journey when a raven was heard to croak in a tree near his indian guide at once declared that he would not go as the raven had warned them of approaching disaster in vain the traveller tried to persuade the indian to fulfil his contract even when a sum of money was offered to him he refused to go being very angry the european gave the man a sound flogging with his horsewhip then to his surprise the indian mounted his mule and said he would accompany the traveller the beating he had received he said in explanation was the disaster the raven had predicted and now there was nothing more to fear end of chapter nine
Chapter Ten of Heroines of Travel by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the Great Lake. The name of Lady Baker, the wife of the intrepid African explorer Sir Samuel Baker, occupies a foremost place among lady travellers in the Dark Continent. She was the first woman to visit the savage races of Central Africa, and the fact that she was accompanied by her husband in no way detracts from her right to be considered a heroine of travel. In 1861, the year after her marriage, her husband decided to set out on an expedition to discover the Great Lake, which we now know as the Albert Nyanza. The undertaking was full of danger and difficulty, but Baker was a man of iron nerve who believed that there was no task too hard to be accomplished by patience and perseverance. When he made his determination known to his wife, she at once expressed her intention of accompanying him. This was a circumstance on which he had not reckoned, and he used every endeavour to dissuade her from her purpose. I shuddered, he says, at the prospect should she be left alone in savage lands at my death, and gladly would I have left her in the luxuries of home instead of exposing her to the miseries of Africa. It was in vain that I implored her to remain, in vain that I painted the difficulties and perils still blacker than I supposed they really would be. She was resolved with woman's constancy and devotion to share all dangers and to follow me through each rough footstep of the wild life before me. Accordingly, in February 1862, we find these two daring adventurers at Gondokoro on the banks of the Nile, buying supplies, engaging men, and making the final preparations for their advance into the great unknown region. It was an arduous task. Baker was regarded as a spy of the British government, and those to whom he applied for assistance threw every obstacle in his way. At length, he obtained a number of men, and arrangements were made to start in a few days. But one morning Mrs. Baker heard from two faithful natives that a plot had been made to murder and rob the travellers. Instantly she summoned the head man to her presence, and sternly asked if the men were ready to march. In bewilderment, the chief replied that they only awaited her orders. Then order them to strike the tents and load the camels. We start at once. Baker came up at this moment, and when he heard how narrowly they had escaped destruction, he ordered the men to form up in line and lay down their guns. The command was disobeyed. Down with your guns this moment cried Baker, as he put his rifle to his shoulder, and Mrs. Baker took her place by his side to point out any man who should attempt to fire. Their determined attitude cowed the mutineers, and they laid down their guns in sullen silence. Finding that they could not obtain a proper escort, the explorers set out with 17 men on the 26th of March, 1863. Mounted on horseback and dressed in a pair of loose trousers and gaiters with a blouse and belt, Mrs. Baker rode beside her husband. The path lay through a rugged, mountainous country, so steep in places that the camels had to be partly unloaded, and all but the most necessary articles thrown away. To add to their trials, the men were lazy and careless. 
the water skins had not been properly filled so the party was in danger of perishing by thirst and a quantity of provisions were lost through wilful neglect of duty throughout these trials mrs baker behaved with heroic fortitude and was ever ready to second her husband under all conditions on the march baker's party was overtaken by a band of traders which had been foremost in thwarting his plans at gondokoro the leader was evidently determined to have nothing to do with baker and the englishman on his part was equally disinclined to have any dealings with him though it was of the utmost importance to conciliate the trader that he should not stir up the natives to oppose the explorer's advance the fate of the expedition hung in the balance in vain mrs baker pleaded with her husband to speak to the man so she herself undertook to interview him the trader came and after a long talk he agreed to accompany the explorers for some distance and assist them to accomplish the object of their mission we cannot follow the expedition step by step as it made its way through swamp and forest terrific floods were encountered their horses died and the leader and his wife were stricken down with fever but still they pressed on never for a moment was the grand object of the journey lost sight of at length they reached Unuro, the country ruled over by king Kamrazi. this potentate had no intention of allowing the travellers to proceed to the lake and though he received many valuable presents he put numberless obstacles in the way of the advance they were completely in his power through sickness and the desertion of their porters and could only wait on till their strength returned sufficiently to enable them to take matters into their own hands finding at length that he could not detain them any longer Camrazi agreed to send them forward on their journey on one condition that baker left his wife behind we can well picture the scene that ensued baker started to his feet in fury and pointing a pistol at the chief's breast told him that if he moved he was a dead man mrs baker in indignant tones gave him to understand that the wife of an englishman was not to be treated as a slave thoroughly surprised that a suggestion so simple in his opinion should have excited the wrath of his guests Camrazi humbly apologized and promised never again to allude to the subject shortly after they left Camrazi the most terrible incident of the trying march took place while they were crossing a river baker turned round to see that his wife was following him when to his horror he saw her sinking through the weeds her face distorted and perfectly purple to rush back and seize hold of her as she fell was the work of a moment then with the help of several of his men he bore her across to the other side and laid her under a tree baker's first impression was that his wife had fainted but as he gazed on her as she lay with clenched hands set teeth and staring eyes the dreadful truth burst upon him it was a case of sunstroke quickly her clothes were changed and everything done that was possible under the circumstances to restore consciousness but in vain a litter was brought and the melancholy party hastened to the next village still mrs baker remained unconscious here the night was spent but in the morning the march was resumed for there was no food to be had in the place 
day after day the unconscious burden was borne over hills and through swamps baker ever by her side all through the night he kept watch over her again and again during these harrowing hours he asked himself the question was she to die was so great a sacrifice to be the result of his selfish exile at length the end seemed to be just at hand we reached a village one evening says baker she had been in violent convulsions successively it was all but over i laid her down on a litter within a hut covered her with a scotch plaid and i fell upon my mat insensible worn out with sorrow and fatigue my men put a new handle to the pickaxe that evening and sought for a dry spot to dig her grave but then there came a change for the better she fell into a calm deep sleep and when she awoke she was saved god alone knows what helped us the gratitude of that moment i will not attempt to describe a few days later on the fourteenth of march eighteen sixty four the worn and weary but inflexible travellers reached the summit of a hill from which they saw stretching away as far as the eye could reach the silver waters of the great lake which for so long had been the goal of their ambitions it is impossible to describe the triumph of that moment here was the reward of all our labour england had won the sources of the nile little now remains for us to tell after exploring the great lake to which they gave the name albert nyanza in honour of the prince consort baker and his wife set out on their return journey which was accomplished in safety on the way they fell in with the trading party they had met on the road from gondokoro these men warmly greeted the europeans and were filled with admiration when they heard all that the travellers had undergone as they kissed mrs baker's hands on parting they exclaimed by allah no woman in the world has a heart so tough as to dare to face what you have gone through End of chapter ten chapter eleven of heroines of travel by frank mundell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By boat, wheelbarrow, and chair. In the letters which Miss Geraldine Guinness wrote describing her experiences in China, many interesting passages occur. This lady was attached to the China Inland Mission and made many journeys in that comparatively unknown land proceeding into the interior by boat she reached yang chan where she was carried through the city in a covered chair on the shoulders of strong coolies to her surprise there was not a street in the city more than twelve feet wide and some were only from four to six feet from side to side in fact the streets were so narrow in some places that there was scarcely room for her chair to pass in order to make themselves well acquainted with the customs of the people and to learn the language miss guinness and a miss reed travelled to sing kiang pu two other english ladies and a native christian lad accompanied them and they made the ten days journey in a boat on the grand canal the owner of the boat agreed to take the party the whole distance of one hundred miles for a sum about equal to a sovereign of our money the rate of speed was to be ten miles a day and the boat was to stop where required for religious teaching 
though usually heartily welcomed at various places on the route they were obliged to pass the long high turreted walls of Kyosin, a large city containing hundreds of thousands of persons as no foreign ladies had up to that time ever been seen in it from the canal they could see the crowded streets into which they dared not venture at certain points hundreds of men were seen hard at work repairing the banks of the canal most of these labourers came from a distance and made their homes in small boats which were moored by scores all along the banks of the stream in these cramped dwellings women and children were seen cooking and washing and performing other domestic duties the boats were quite open and the only shelter the poor people had was two or three grass mats at the end of the vessel many of the boats were two-thirds filled with mud to be used for the embankment and the whole family had to be satisfied with the small space left these workmen were not highly paid says miss guinness a hundred cash a day which comes to about fourpence seems to be the ordinary wage of these poor labourers how they live at all upon such a sum i cannot imagine yet they seem cheerful and thriving poor souls the natives of this region live in constant dread of the huang ho or yellow river which has been well named the ungovernable and the sorrow of the sons of han it brings down so much yellow earth from the mountains that it has raised its bed to a higher level than the country through which it flows only by means of embankments is it kept within bounds and when it bursts these it sweeps away towns and villages and devastates whole provinces nine times has this unruly river been known to change its course the men whom miss guinness saw so busy were preparing for the next flood which should come and even then she found that great anxiety was being felt for the water had already begun to rise the dilatory movements of the authorities were to her a matter of astonishment when they could not but know that only the slightest of barriers stood between the country and terrible devastation and loss of life after a short stay at sing kiang pu miss guinness went to antong this part of the journey was made in a wheelbarrow she was accompanied by miss macfarlane and the two ladies sat one on either side of the wheel under an umbrella and were pushed along by a coolie to persons who have lived in a country where even the steam engine scarcely travels fast enough to satisfy the busy time-saving inhabitants a wheelbarrow is certainly a primitive mode of conveyance yet in many parts of china it is the chief if not the only land carriage and the mainstay of chinese travel when they came to a river the travellers were ferried across barrow and all small towns and villages surrounded by fields of waving corn were passed so frequently that there was no feeling of loneliness on every side there were dwellings low thatched cottages in each of which lived three generations at least including sons and sons wives and children's children indeed there seemed to be no limit to the number of persons that could be accommodated in one small dwelling at length the wheelbarrow stopped at a farmhouse at antong entering by a wicker gate the ladies passed into an enclosed yard round which the buildings were ranged 
then they were led into a large dirty room in which there was no window the only opening for light and air being the door the floors and the walls were of mud and the sole furniture of the apartment consisted of one table two chairs and one or two small rough wooden forms though welcomed by the farmer some members of the family were afraid of their visitor's presence being made known in the neighbourhood were dangerous bands of robbers and it was thought that these men would make a descent on the place if it was heard that foreigners were lodged there new quarters were therefore found for a time and then a cottage was engaged at nang Kietzi. but before the ladies took possession of it the owner sent them word that he dared not let them have it for fear the mandarin would come and cut off his head so they stayed at the house of their farmer friend's brother who armed himself with a great iron bar for defence against the robber bands he nightly expected as these marauders were armed with knives which they did not scruple to use this formidable weapon was not unnecessary their host's house had already been attacked and stripped of everything even the clothing his family were wearing at the time was carried off after several wheelbarrow journeys to and from places in the neighbourhood miss guinness made a voyage in a chinese river steamer to the poyang lake wishing to get at the people she travelled steerage with some three hundred chinese the vessel was three stories high most of the chinamen had no cabins but simply slept on deck there were very few native women on board and the men spent most of their time lying down and smoking opium the passengers were all very friendly and willing to listen to the teaching of the strangers they were no doubt influenced in their conduct by the presence of europeans on board for the officers were english and among the passengers was a brother of the tsar of russia after this miss guinness made a journey in central china from hankow to honan part of the journey was made by water the boat being drawn by men instead of horses as in england in fact in that overcrowded country there is nothing so cheap as human labour the cost of living is so small and so little is paid for clothing that wages are very low the dwellings of the poor are also of the slightest description says miss guinness the huts were poor concerns enough merely grass mats with bamboo frames and some sort of thatch roof above standing on the sand they certainly had one advantage that of being easily moved while watching we saw one of these tenements apparently walking on a dozen legs over the soft sand no men were visible carrying it until it had walked quite down into the row of other huts and settled itself comfortably in its new surroundings and then six men walked composedly out from within and the flitting was done leaving the boat the traveller was again conveyed by chair through a very desolate part of the country which was then covered with snow in fact it seemed to answer the description so often given of siberia the first night was spent in a building which would have made a good-sized pigsty at home it was the granary barn living and sleeping room for the innkeeper's family and the guest chamber for better class travellers also says the lady to judge by appearances 
it might have been used as a dustbin and general receptacle for all refuse that could not well be thrown elsewhere for on the floor were heaps indescribable heaps during the following day crowds of natives gathered at the various halting places to see the traveller but though eager and curious they would not have anything to do with the stranger this unwillingness seemed to be to a great extent the result of fear on the second night the lady had to sleep in a room the loft of which was occupied by men there was no help for it and she had to shift as best she could while a dozen or twenty men passed freely through the apartment to the ladder which gave access to the upper quarters this was bad enough but next day even this poor accommodation was denied her the landlord of the inn in which she prepared to pass the night would not entertain them at all in a great fright he insisted on them moving to the next stopping place she had no choice but to re-enter her chair and in the driving snow and cutting wind make her way to the next inn it consisted of one room a shed by the roadside which was already occupied by a number of men here long reeds were used to make a partition and separate the women from the men on the other side of this slight wall the men lighted a fire in the middle of the floor and the whole building was so thickly filled with clouds of smoke that the traveller was almost stifled unable to remain inside she picked her way over the recumbent figures on the floor and remained outside in the piercing night air till the room was cleared of smoke several nights were passed in no better lodgings she was not only obliged to share the same room as the chair-bearer and other travellers but animals were lodged with them the natives indeed seemed to have no idea of comfort or cleanliness as to privacy of any kind that never entered into their arrangements they lived and ate and slept in public to european women it was one of the greatest trials they had to undergo never to be able to spend five minutes without being gazed on by the curious eyes of the natives and in the towns they simply did not dare to go about alone end of chapter 11chapter twelve of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain to the great wall of china when miss seward an american lady traveller was in china she paid a visit to the great wall which is beyond question the most stupendous line of defence that has ever been constructed by the hand of man mule litters were provided for the party as the roads are too bad for horses to travel the conveyance consists of an oblong box in which the traveller can lie down it is hung by heavy solid shafts to the backs of two mules one in front and one behind each litter is furnished with a heated brazier a mattress and pillows fur robes blankets and rugs the traveller was dressed for the journey in a long fox-skin coat astrakhan cap high white mandarin boots and large fur mittens this constituted her daily and nightly attire for some time the rate of progress was very slow and only averaged about two miles an hour the motion of the litter was also very uncomfortable as the mules never 
under any circumstances are known to keep step the constant jolting made reading impossible and the country was so bleak that if it had not been entirely strange the journey would have been intolerably dull it was with feelings of relief that the lady and her companions arrived at the end of the first day's journey and put up at an inn they were told that it was large enough to accommodate one hundred persons if so the number in each room would not be less than fifteen or twenty there were only six rooms in all and when miss seward's party engaged the lot for ten persons the landlord was speechless with astonishment eastern ideas of hotel accommodation are very different from ours travellers are quite satisfied to lie down together with their beasts of burden the rooms of the inn are built round an open court which serves as a stable for donkeys mules and camels great freedom is allowed or at any rate taken and often little difference is made between an animal and its master what is good enough for the one is considered to be equally good for the other the windows of the room had been at one time glazed with greased paper but most of it had disappeared the floor was rough pavement which had the appearance of never having been swept since it was laid down and certainly never washed the walls and the ceilings were black with smoke the one piece of furniture was a stationary bed built against the wall it consisted of a brick platform about three feet high with an oven underneath and flues to distribute the heat on this brick bed native travellers spread mats of bamboo and then tucked themselves like sardines in a tin miss seward brought the mattress furs and blankets from her litter and lay down on them after wrapping herself in her fox-skin coat four days and nights very much alike were passed before the great wall was reached at an inn about fifteen miles from the end of the journey a poor man named ping wizened and deformed made his way to them and begged by signs and gestures to be allowed to go with them as guide from his bootleg he produced a bundle of references and as he was recommended by some navy officers whom miss seward knew he was allowed to join the party the mule litters were left at nankow and the travellers were conveyed forward in chinese mountain chairs these were small seats made of bamboo with low arms and a swinging stirrup for the feet each chair had bamboo shafts and was borne on the shoulders of four strong nimble-footed coolies nankow pass is a wide dark ravine through which mountain torrents have forced their way for hundreds of years on either hand rose bleak grim mountains the sides of which were everywhere coated with ice from time to time the travellers met long swaying caravans winding their way through the lonely defile the camels choosing their way carefully among the heaps of rock and timber which strewed the path at length the great wall was reached and the travellers found that it was a realisation of the pictures they had so often seen in their lesson books a solid granite structure twenty to fifty feet high and really wide enough for six horses to traverse it abreast stretching and winding over the crests of the mountains and over the slopes of the plains as far as the eye can follow and for leagues and leagues beyond the distance broken at every mile 
by high square watch-towers of defence it was four o'clock when the party alighted from their chairs and ascended the granite stairs which led to the parapet then with curious eyes they examined the mighty fortification and were surprised to find how little there was to see beyond the one great feature the mighty wall which seemed to have neither a beginning nor an end it was dark when the travellers again threaded the pass on their way down and being tired and apprehensive no attempt was made to engage in conversation one by one the chairs became separated and before miss seward was aware of it she found herself quite alone with her four coolie bearers who skipped and tripped along at an alarming rate nor did they pay any attention to the path but hurried over the hills as fast as they could go unable to address them in their own language the lady motioned to them in the most emphatic manner to put her down but this only caused them to laugh in derision and hurry along still faster she tried to cheer herself with the thought that her bearers were taking a shorter path and that she would soon see her friends of whom there was not now the slightest sign at last they came to a small settlement of a few squalid huts huddled together which she had not seen before these were surrounded by a crowd of chinese men and boys who were warming themselves at a large fire of corn stalks one glance showed the terrified lady that not one of her party had arrived at this out-of-the-way place there she was alone at night in a desolate and hostile country surrounded by fierce natives who hated her very race with relentless vindictiveness one after another there flashed through her mind the many stories she had heard and read of chinese massacres with little ceremony the bearer almost flung her chair on the ground and lying down beside it engaged in conversation hoping to impress them by a cool demeanour miss seward looked at them as calmly and sternly as she could without showing the fear she felt they seemed somewhat puzzled at this and drawing near pointed to her white boots and fur cap which were signs of rank what their purpose was in carrying her off she could not imagine at the worst she hoped they had done so to obtain a ransom one of them pulled off her white overboots and regarded the button boots underneath as an object of great curiosity another offered her his pipe to smoke while a third pulled off her great fur mitten her gloved hand encased in a dark kid was a great surprise to them they held it close to her face and compared the difference of colour and could not find words to express their amazement when the brown skin peeled off the lady felt very indignant when her astrakhan cap was snatched from her head and one of the ragged fellows ran his long dark fingers through her hair she was rapidly losing consciousness the result of the nervous strain when she was called to herself by the sound of a familiar voice shouting her name and speaking in tones of authority to the coolies instantly the manner of the men changed from insolence to the greatest humility without a word they shouldered their burden and took the path to nan cow as quickly as they could pass along the ragged road miss seward had been missed at the first halting place and ping to whom she had shown great kindness at once led the way to the clump of huts where she was held captive when the coolies saw the little man they looked very angrily at him 
and full of fear he took care to keep out of their reach why the lady had been carried off neither she nor her friends could discover fortunately help came before any real harm was done but she says that she did not soon forget the ordeal of these few hours during which she was at the mercy of four powerful chinese coolies ragged and dirty beyond description and unscrupulous in their treatment of the hated foreigner ping received many thanks and such a hatful of chinese coppers that in the eyes of his coolie neighbours he was a very rich man peking was reached in safety on the fourth day and the party received a hearty welcome at the american legation End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain a girl in the carpathians one of the chief features of the meeting of the british association at leeds in eighteen ninety was the appearance of miss menna muriel dowie a granddaughter of the late robert chambers the publisher to read a paper describing her adventures in the carpathians in a manner eloquent clever refined vigorous and womanly she described her wanderings in these out-of-the-way regions in masculine garb but alone and unattended she set out reaching in due course kolomia in poland after obtaining refreshments miss dowie put her watch and money under her pillow laid her revolver and matches on a chair and was soon afterwards sound asleep early next morning she visited the market where she was an object of some curiosity and ordered horses to take her on her way soon a little conveyance with half a haystack roped on behind appeared at the door getting inside with all her baggage including a saddle the lady said to the driver to the mountains her road lay through a flat country on either side grew tall poplars with here and there rough-hewn crosses from time to time peasants were met driving little long wooden carts which made a great noise as they rattled along many of them took off their hats to the visitor while the children ran alongside to beg in the afternoon a short stay was made at a little mountain town to feed the horses while this was being done miss dowie went into the inn and ordered food a jewess waited on her and asked a number of curious questions and was very much surprised to learn that her visitor did not know where she was going she also wanted to know to what country and religion the lady belonged then the landlord entered the room and tried to persuade miss dowie to remain in the town offering at the same time to sell let hire or provide her with anything she could possibly require promising to remember him and his family the traveller again set out and reached the next village about seven o'clock in the evening here she left the carriage and proceeded on horseback attended by a young jew to whom the animal belonged about ten o'clock they reached a farmhouse inhabited by a polish family who agreed to board her for about one shilling and eightpence a day so dismissing the jew and taking the saddle from the horse she had been riding she followed the mistress of the house into a wide square chamber soon the woman brought in soup and this was followed by tea 
which was drunk out of a small tumbler then tired out miss dowie made herself as comfortable as possible and went off to sleep in this farmhouse in company with two other lodgers an artist and a delicate man in search of health she settled down for a time and leisurely explored the neighbourhood the daily life of the villagers was not without interest to a stranger but in the main one day was very much like another there was a tendency she says in the conditions at the farm to make one fat lazy and well-liking at length she arranged to leave her comfortable quarters and her departure made quite a stir at that out-of-the-way place where visitors from the outside world were few and far between jaco a peasant woodcarver agreed to furnish horses and take the lady on to cosmets for a sum equal to five shillings a day there was however a bare wood on the route and not being very courageous jaco stipulated that this dangerous part should be passed by day as he feared to enter it by night in spite of the peasants fears they passed this wood in safety once they heard something and jaco stopped dead saying bear to comfort him miss dowie laughed and fired her revolver to warn any animal that might be near that he would not have all his own way if he attacked them but no bear appeared cosmates was reached about seven o'clock where she was accommodated in the priest's house it happened at that time to be vacant the owner being away on a journey it was a one-storied eight-roomed house with gardens farmyard and fields attached the sacristan or beadle and his wife lived in the kitchen and they prepared food for their unexpected guest this consisted of potatoes and sour milk with salads made from the vegetables which grew in the garden the bed consisted of hay and though excellent sleeping was not as comfortable as it might have been seeing that it was simply alive with fleas here she spent several days and was somewhat disconcerted by the way the peasants wandered about the house and entered her room without even knocking as she was enjoying a free lodging however she did not see how she could keep them out on the sunday she went to church and saw hundreds of brilliantly dressed peasants posed in the most picturesque groups what costumes she says what colours what appearances what groups what figures what heads then at six on the following morning she resumed her travels and soon came to a great wooded mountain up which the horses had to be literally dragged the climb was such a stiff one that miss dowie was sure that no english horse would have cared to try it on reaching a peasant's hut a halt was made and milk and sheep's cheese obtained this with some cold potatoes they had brought with them made a very satisfying meal then to her annoyance miss dowie discovered that she had lost her gold watch back they went and sought in the most likely places where the horse fell and where they had stopped to pick wild strawberries bushes were carefully examined and leaves turned over but strange to say the watch was at length found in the polish pass continuing her journey she ascended another mountain and met with a man in charge of oxen only the day before a large bear had attacked one of the herd he fired a pistol at the beast 
and was in turn attacked but managed to escape to his hut and barricade himself inside unable to get at the man the bear returned and devoured the ox the mountain path now became so steep that it was a breakneck scramble to reach the valley unable to keep their footing the horses were often obliged to slide down the face of the rock it was slow and tiring work but the descent was accomplished without accident arriving at a village the richest man in the place called blinder because one of his eyes had been poured out by a bear invited the lady to spend the night at his house it was only a peasant's cottage but the rest and refreshment sorely needed were very welcome and soon the tired traveller was fast asleep in a bed of hay in a corner of the open courtyard a thick blanket lent by blinder protected her from the cold zaby was reached on the following day and so charming did this valley appear that miss dowie at once exclaimed this is luxury not a step farther do i go dinner at this place was a very simple meal it consisted of cheese potatoes bread and a salad the coffee was drunk out of a cup on which was painted the winter gardens of southport and at the foot the words made in bohemia taking a house for three weeks miss dowie wandered about this beautiful place and made herself acquainted with the people men and women worked in the fields cutting the hay and binding it into bundles but all worked leisurely there seemed to be plenty of time for everything one fine morning she set out from zaby for the high mountains accompanied by a young peasant named jura the scenery was very beautiful and wild fruit raspberries strawberries and whortleberries grew in abundance few persons were met on the road and a wonderful silence brooded over all the scene towards evening they discovered that jura had lost his way and he was sent back to find a boy who had been seen playing with a flock of kids to point out the right path it was surprising how near they were to the road when the lad came and put them right as they proceeded in the twilight they saw a cross by the wayside it was to mark the spot where somebody had been murdered that night was spent in a shepherd's hut built of pine logs between which was an inch to spare for fresh air two large holes in the roof served the one for a chimney and the other for a window a fire of wood burned on the floor in the middle of the hut an armful of fir branches piled in a corner served for a bed the next day miss dowie climbed to the top of the highest mountain in the group it was not permanently snow crowned but snow remained every summer in the cracks and fissures on the summit she flung herself down in a fearful glow for she had raced the final fifty yards at top speed then she became conscious that something was wrong with her the searching wind at that elevation did not cool her hot as she was her skin was dry and red she realized that she was attacked with skin and blood fever caused by the bites of numerous insects which had been a continued plague for weeks and from which there was no escape what was to be done it was indeed a serious matter to be taken ill on a mountain top and so far away from home and kindred as she sat on the ground with her back against a rock two large eagles circled above her head 
were they aware that she was ill and might possibly fall a prey to their beaks and talons pulling herself together she told jura to collect some snow and from all kinds of impossible places he scooped it up and brought it in his hat this miss dowie shoveled inside her undergarments next to her skin and the result was wonderful she says that snow saved my life another hut in the mountainside gave her shelter that night then she once more made her way back to the lovely zaby after a visit to Cosson, the nearest town she was conveyed to her starting point this time in a phaeton reaching the railway in due course End of chapter 13chapter 14 of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain lady florence dixie in patagonia among the numerous adventures which that enterprising traveller lady florence dixie has had in the course of her interesting life her adventures in patagonia take no second place in 1878, she conceived the idea of journeying through the wilds of that little unknown land, and on the 11th of December of the same year, accompanied by her husband and several friends, she set sail from Liverpool. The voyage to Rio de Janeiro was made without event, but they had not long to wait for adventure immediately after entering the city the travellers decided to drive to tijuca a small village among the hills a carriage with four spirited mules was the conveyance and a good start was made the native who occupied the box would hardly have been called a good driver in england but in spite of his recklessness which made the travellers momentarily expect an upset all went well until they reached the summit of a steep hill at the other side of which lay tijuca here one of the mules became restive the driver began to beat it unmercifully and the travellers fearing the consequences got out of the carriage and walked down the hill the next moment the carriage dashed forward at a furious pace and was soon lost to view when lady florence and her companions reached the foot of the hill they found the wreck of the carriage the mules struggling and kicking in their traces and the driver sitting unhurt by the roadside calmly viewing the situation another adventure lady florence had while in tijuca was while wandering among the gorgeous woods there a delightful green bank invited her to sit down but her dog just then darted at something in the grass and to her horror she saw the long twisting body of a snake of the cross whose bite is almost instantly fatal gliding away the adventures of this short journey were not yet ended before starting for rio next morning they impressed caution upon the driver of their carriage but they had hardly taken their seats when the mules bolted the road was downhill with a sharp turn beyond which it crossed a stream at this point the carriage was balanced on two wheels for a moment the next moment the driver had fallen into the stream and the occupants of the carriage were buried beneath the vehicle happily no bones were broken and they speedily extricated themselves and continued their journey on a stagecoach which fortunately came up at this moment before they reached their destination however they were fated to have another adventure 
for again the horses bolted but lady dixie and her companions jumping out escaped with a few cuts and bruises it is not to be wondered at that the party now made up their minds to perform the rest of the journey on foot which accordingly they did embarking again the party sailed southward entered the straits of magellan and finally disembarked at sandy point a miserable tumble-down town which had then been recently devastated by a band of rebels here several days were spent buying horses and dogs and engaging guides and packing the provisions which they had brought from england in suitable bundles for transit on horseback at length all was in readiness and a start was made for the pampas the first few days of their march were made exciting by the constant watchfulness which they had to maintain over the pack horses if from any cause such as the cords of the pack becoming loose and causing the contents to rattle an animal became restive its companions would instantly take to their heels and scamper off across the plains snap went the cords and the packs fell off and those in pursuit could trace the fugitives by the biscuit bags tin kettles and other impedimenta with which the ground was strewn such incidents were of frequent occurrence and though the pursuit and capture of the animals was a hard and dangerous task lady florence took her share of the work with the greatest delight one day as the travellers were riding over the pampas a faint smell of burning assailed their nostrils and in a short time they were horrified to see dense volumes of smoke rolling towards them in front and on the right and left there was an unbroken wall of smoke and as they knew fire lay behind it presently there appeared through the smoke great forked tongues of flame which fanned by the wind rushed towards them with marvellous rapidity there could be no questioning what it meant the prairie was on fire to race the flames was out of the question the only chance of escape was to gallop through the belt of flame and reach the other side if possible there was at least a chance of life any other course was certain death it took them but an instant to throw their mantles over their heads dig spurs into their horses and charge the fire the terrified animals plunged and kicked and refused to face the flames but their riders were determined and forced them forward the moments that followed seemed an eternity says lady florence dixie describing the scene as i urged my unwilling horse forward the sense of suffocation grew terrible i could scarcely draw breath and the panting animal seemed to stagger beneath me the horrible crackling came nearer and nearer i became conscious of the most intolerable heat and my head began to swim round my horse gave two or three furious plunges and then burst madly forward almost choked come what might i could bear the mantle over my head no longer and tore it off the sudden sense of relief that came over me as i did so i shall never forget i looked up the air was comparatively clear and the fire behind me by some miracle i had passed through it unhurt her companions were equally fortunate the chief sufferers being the poor horses which were severely burnt on again over the undulating pampas the travellers rode day after day 
experiencing the full enjoyment of the free life of the open prairie and at the same time suffering many of its discomforts hardly a day passed that did not find them engaged in an exciting hunt after guanaco or ostrich occasionally a puma crossed their path and then there was work of a rather more serious nature but none of them were ever injured then after a time they entered into a mountain region with which even their guides were not familiar through the gorges of the cordilleras they wandered day after day without coming across a single sign of the presence of human beings and rarely encountering any wild animals it was a grand wild picturesque life a silence deep as death reigned over everything but there was no sense of loneliness or depression the chief danger they encountered in this region was from troops of wild horses one evening while they were sitting round the campfire after supper there came in sight what appeared to be a troop of indians but which on a near approach was seen to be a herd of wild horses quick get ready your rifles or we shall lose our horses was the cry the party needed no further urging and all hurried off lady florence included to the spot where the horses were grazing to repel the danger quick as they went the wild horses went quicker and their leader a fine handsome animal flew like the wind a shot fired at him served only to quicken his pace when he was within a few yards of the horses he was brought to a standstill the leading animal of the tame troop accepted his challenge and came out to do battle the travellers watched the fray with a very real interest should the wild horse prove victorious they were lost and they trembled at the thought of being left three hundred miles from sandy point without means of transport or conveyance while the combat was raging fiercely between the two animals the travellers managed to reach their horses and drove them towards the camp and when the wild horse again came down on them a few shots sent him scampering away with all his troop with two of her friends lady dixie made a daring journey among the mountains to visit three peaks called cleopatra's needles the road lay down the side of a ravine so steep that they had to dismount and lead their horses it was exciting work for a single false step would have sent them headlong into the river which flowed three hundred feet below this part of the journey was accomplished in safety and they forded the river after this the road lay through a dense forest of beechwood over and over again they were forced to retrace their steps owing to the density of the undergrowth sometimes what appeared to be a broad stretch of level ground was rendered quite impassable on account of a belt of bog stretching right across it at length after four hours arduous travelling they cleared the forest darkness was now coming on and they decided to camp for the night by the side of a stream supper was cooked and eaten with a relish such as only comes after a day of toil in the open air of the mountains then the weary travellers wrapped themselves in their cloaks and with their saddles for pillows went to sleep under the vault of heaven fretted with gold and fire the journey was resumed early next morning and after a few hours riding 
a broad lake was seen lying near the three peaks which the travellers intended to visit they therefore decided to ride first to the lake which they reached after a terrible scramble through forests and bogs and over rocks it was a magnificent sheet of water encircled by tall hills on which grew a profusion of vegetation reaching down to the water's edge the three peaks in the distance were distinctly reflected on the surface and so awe-inspiring was the scene that we stood as if spellbound none of us uttering a word after a time they rode round to the head of the lake and encamped for the night this was the limit of their journey and in the morning they set out for the camp which they reached at nightfall having performed the ride in one day when lady dixie rejoined her friends a council of war was held to decide on their future movements provisions were becoming alarmingly scarce the biscuit bag especially being very low the horses too were showing signs of overexertion after carefully considering the pros and cons of the whole situation the travellers agreed to set out on the return journey without delay a start was accordingly made and for the first few days all went well then the good weather which had attended them throughout their wanderings began to desert them one evening when they camped the sky looked very threatening and before long a fearful storm of wind and rain was raging in the midst of it the tents were carried away rugs and clothes were blown about in all directions and the utmost confusion prevailed in the darkness it was impossible to see a yard in front and the fury of the gale prevented the erection of a temporary shelter so that there was nothing for it but to sit and wait for daylight about four o'clock in the morning the wind fell and shortly afterwards camp was struck and the day's march begun that afternoon the horse which carried the bags containing the biscuits their most precious commodity suddenly took fright and bolted trusting to the firmness with which the pack had been tied on they had no fears but they did not dream of the strain to which it would be subjected gradually it slipped down and down the horse felt the weight and kicked out with such force that in a few minutes the pack fell off when lady dixie rode up to see the extent of the damage she found the precious biscuits reduced to a fine powder and their chief comfort and support gone but other hardships were in store later on the supply of meat failed and though the party divided themselves into hunting parties no success attended their efforts one day lady dixie and her husband went out hunting together and stalked a herd of guanaco for nearly a whole day without getting a successful shot it was late when they started to follow the trail to the camp their horses were thoroughly worn out and darkness came on before they had completed the distance to proceed farther was out of the question so they lit a fire and sat round it patiently to wait for daylight when they were enabled to resume their journey and break their fast after breakfast that morning there was no food of any kind in the camp under such circumstances no time was lost in pushing forward to sandy point but many things happened to cause delay the horses were lost 
and had it not been for a happy thought on the part of lady dixie to search a secluded valley the delay might have been serious we can form some idea of their sufferings on this part of the return journey from the fact that all they had for supper one night was two small ducks fancy this among eight people after a cup of coffee says lady dixie we drew our belts a little tighter pushing onward though faint with hunger the travellers arrived in the course of a few days at their starting point where they obtained the food of which they stood so greatly in need a few days afterwards they embarked on board a steamer bound for england and said good-bye to their faithful guides who had led them for a careless happy time across the lonely trackless pampas End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain the first circumnavigation of lake charla a few years ago one of our most modern heroines of travel known as mrs french sheldon made a daring journey into the interior of east africa in search of knowledge concerning the character and customs of the primitive races who inhabit these little known and less understood regions with a band of fifty picked porters she set out from Taveta, fully equipped to encounter the dangers and hardships of a journey to lake charla the famous unexplored crater lake on the northeastern side of kilimanjaro over four thousand feet above the sea level the march was fatiguing but no dangers of an alarming nature were encountered but if there had been the intrepid lady would willingly have faced and endured them for a sight of the mysterious water whose very origin was lost in legend and superstitious story according to tradition there was once a Maasai village located on the side of the mountain but the people enriched by successful war and plunder neglected to pay tribute to the great god of the mountain in punishment he caused their village to be thrown into the air by a great volcanic eruption this was followed by a tremendous rush of water which filled up the space and so formed the lake at length mrs french sheldon reached the lake and the sight which met her gaze amply repaid her for the journey about a thousand feet below the spot lay a sheet of sparkling water about two and a half miles across at its widest part and from six to eight miles in circumference the sides of the crater were walled with huge masses of rough precipitous rock while indeterminable vines and thickly grown forest trees presented on all sides a forbidding appearance joseph thompson the famous african explorer who died not long ago visited the lake and thus records his impressions he says i went all round it and though i am not deficient in enterprise or nerve i saw no place that i dared descend not even if i could have swung from creeper to creeper like a monkey and as mrs sheldon looked at the dense overgrowth and the still denser undergrowth she was almost forced in spite of herself to come to the same conclusion she had come out with the intention of making a voyage on these waters and for that purpose had brought with her a small copper canoe in sections it seemed to her that an ability to fly was the only solution then came the thought 
that she had come to africa to encounter and if possible overcome difficulties not to theorize or give up without an attempt she accordingly made up her mind to hazard the descent accompanied by her two most trusty men she set out leaving instructions to the rest to follow at a given signal the farther they proceeded the difficulties of the way proportionately increased her two porters hacked and hewed but without making much impression on the screen of huge trees and matted undergrowth at length a small opening was made through which the intrepid lady was drawn then more determined efforts had to be made to effect farther progress the toughness of the wood and the density of the forest were such that the advance was extremely slow but they conquered by their persistence and won a few yards nearer the goal of their strivings it required no small amount of nerve and agility to enable mrs sheldon to crawl and slide and worm her way along once she says i found myself on a boulder which was balanced upon another boulder and every moment's delay seemed to imperil my equilibrium several times she landed on a bed of leaves the accumulated autumn tribute of the trees for centuries into which she sank up to her neck and was only hauled out by the united exertions of her men again the advance had to be continued by clutching the overhanging branches of trees and clinging monkey-like from one to another with no little effort and at no slight risk till a proper footing could be reached ever and again some lightning-smitten forest giant had spread his mighty bulk across the path and while the traveller was negotiating this fresh obstacle there would come thundering down from above a mass of rock which fell on the tree scattering its white splinters in all directions birds startled by the strange sounds flew with whirling noise from their nests a whistling eagle beat the air with its wings directly overhead scattering its feathers like storm-blown flowers in its wild flight and white hooded owls peered out from sequestered nooks and to hooed in solemn amazement creeping on hands and knees cautiously groping with fingers and feet slowly laboriously and painfully the descent was continued among the long twining tendrils of rubber vines over rocks and fallen trees the darkness the danger and the awful silence of this forest primeval impressed mrs sheldon most deeply and it also considerably affected her guides in awe-stricken whispers they pointed out the path and sometimes as if afraid to utter a sound her guide would stretch out his hand only in time to save her from going headlong down a precipitous cliff instead however of such incidents making mrs sheldon wish herself safely out of the place it filled her with fresh excitement and imparted new courage and i determined to overcome the difficulties of the uncanny spot cost what it might so long as i should be able to crawl or climb or slide or step or simply let myself go with utter blindness and risk the consequences for the goal bewitched me in anticipation at length a gleam of light shone in upon the travellers and in another moment they stood on the edge of the lake we shall not attempt a description of mrs sheldon's feelings as she stood by the waters lost in the wonder and amazement of triumph 
the men who had guided her and their companions were forgotten for the moment till one of them reminded her that they were waiting her signal to bring down the canoe her shrill whistle was answered by a deafening shout followed by a confusion of sounds as the porters struggled to bring down their heavy burden in an incredibly short space of time this was successfully accomplished though unsightly gashes in the shoulders of many of the bearers told how difficult and arduous had been the task the sections were put together and the little vessel was launched but when afloat it looked anything but a safe craft in which to explore these unknown waters there was however no other means at her disposal and mrs sheldon called for men to accompany her then a fresh difficulty arose not one of her followers would risk his life on such an expedition no no they said trembling with fright we will not go see the crocodiles inshallah or god willing we will remain with our feet under us on shore they drew her attention to the strange unaccountable murmuring sound which she had already noticed and told her that it was caused by the groaning of the unhappy spirits of the people who formerly lived in the village and who now lay at the bottom of the lake the noise of the wind among the trees was the bleating of their cattle and sheep and the clapping of the reeds was the cackling of their fowls hoping to arouse them to a sense of their duty mrs sheldon upbraided them as cowards goats and jungle men but nothing seemed to be able to shake their resolution they were deaf alike to threats and reproaches things were looking serious when the interpreter stepped forward and gallantly offered to share the perils and glory of the enterprise having fastened a long rope to the canoe in case of accidents the daring lady and her companion pushed off leaving instructions with her men to haul her back with might and main should anything happen they paddled out onto the water which literally swarmed with crocodiles and no little skill was needed to steer clear of the monsters the men on shore paid out the rope till it was exhausted and when mrs sheldon had come to the end of her tether she found that her tiny craft was rather more manageable than she had supposed she therefore cut the rope a proceeding which was answered by a dismal despairing wail from the men on shore who stood in momentary expectation of a catastrophe gazing up at the steep cliffs says mrs sheldon on all sides the vines hanging in festoons and the weird weird beauty of the various foliage contrasting with the grand trunks of whitened trees the strange murmur of the waters the remarkable outbreak of waves crested with foam the small circle of sky as i looked up and the mad tumble of rocks all contributed to make it seem as though i was in some phantom land at the firing of a gun the reverberations came back like a thunderclap sharp crashing great flocks of aquatic birds rose from the midst of the crater and on the approach of the canoe they dived into the water and the traveller saw them closely pursued by the crocodiles so clear was the lake the feeling of awe amounting indeed to superstitious dread which the scenery inspired was still more heightened by the circumstances which attended the circumnavigation of the lake when mrs sheldon plunged her paddle rather deeply into the water the suction was so great that it was nearly drawn out of her hand and she only recovered it with great difficulty 
the water too was frequently agitated in places by some unaccountable influence for sheltered as it was by a lofty and unbroken basin of rock no wind could possibly have swept down and caused the disturbance mrs sheldon tasted the water and found it soft and agreeable and in temperature two degrees cooler than the atmosphere the daring traveller made several voyages on the lake and before leaving she buried her little craft on its shores for future use on several of the rocks round the margin she printed her name in red letters to commemorate her exploit mrs sheldon next turned her adventurous footsteps towards the villages occupied by the primitive rombos they had the reputation of being a fierce and treacherous tribe who lived chiefly by plundering caravans passing through their territory so to protect herself from any surprise mrs sheldon took the precaution of having her men well armed but at the same time she made up her mind not to appeal to force unless under the most pressing danger and then only when all other means had failed she further gave her men strict orders that while they were in that region they were not to discharge their firearms not even at wild animals for fear of giving offence to the people on entering the rombo country she was greatly struck by the number of animal pits or traps which she found and which rendered it unsafe to walk about without a native guide frequently the unsuspecting traveller journeying with his caravan by night comes to grief in one of these pits indeed there are trustworthy instances on record of men who have thus fallen into the very jaws of lions which had already been trapped on approaching the rombo villages mrs sheldon was frequently invited by the people to stay with them but remembering their evil reputation she refused till she could decide from their behaviour what were their intentions at length after careful observation she came to the conclusion that she might safely do so and yielding to the earnest invitation of the chief man of one of the villagers she took up her quarters at the place her welcome was of a very hearty kind the villagers vied with one another in their attempts to make her comfortable they presented her with beautiful furs and if by chance she admired anything it was at once presented to her to refuse these gifts was out of the question but she in return gave them pieces of bright coloured cloth with which they made cloaks and turbans mrs sheldon's stay with these hospitable people was brought to rather an abrupt and unexpected termination one day while she was sitting with a number of visitors she found time hanging heavily for she had exhausted all her amusements suddenly she remembered that she had brought with her some gaily coloured toy birds which by means of an india rubber tube and ball could be made to hop about as if alive just the very thing she thought so telling her guests that she had something to show them she ran off to her caravan and in a few minutes returned she wound up her musical box and with as great an air of mystery as she could command prepared to reveal her treasures the warriors sat round the tent in a state of high expectation but the moment that the toy birds began to hop about as the natives thought of their own accord they gave vent to a hideous yell and rising to their feet fled tumbling over one another in their eagerness to escape mrs sheldon laughed at what was to her a good joke 
and she waited in the hope that when the warriors had got over their fright they would return to see the finish of the performance but they did not come nor did any of the tribe approach her as evening fell mrs sheldon felt that the silence was ominous and she began to fear that in showing the birds she had in some way offended the people and that by her action she had placed her life and the lives of her followers in imminent danger such indeed was the case next morning she received a message from the chief man of the tribe telling her that she must leave at once it was in vain that she expostulated and showed through her interpreter that she had only intended to amuse her guests not to harm them her protest was indignantly passed over she had been guilty of practising the black art and leave she must to make sure of her departure they refused to supply her with food for her men so there was nothing for it but to push onward with as great speed as possible mrs sheldon eventually reached her starting point in safety after what she modestly describes as a most interesting and pleasant journey End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of heroines of travel by frank mundell this librivox recording is in the public domain through cannibal country one of the latest and by no means the least of the heroines of travel is miss mary h kingsley who in eighteen ninety five made an adventurous journey in western equatorial africa to collect specimens of freshwater fish and make researches into the fetish customs of the natives miss kingsley is the niece of charles kingsley the author of westward ho she is described as being lithe and vigorous in person and of a buoyant and courageous disposition in december eighteen ninety four she set sail from liverpool arriving at old calabar she set out for the french settlement of gaboon where she made it known to the authorities that she wished to make a journey into the gorilla country in the interior of the gaboon territory and also to go up the ogowi river to Njole, a distance of two hundred and six miles the french authorities were greatly interested in her proposed expedition and promised to afford her every possible assistance she was taken up the agoe river by the little french steamer which plies on it and on her arrival at Anjoli, she made ready for her expedition farther up the river after no little difficulty she got together a canoe's crew of eight natives and started for the rapids this trip proved singularly adventurous a score of times the canoe was upset and its occupants were thrown into the water fortunately no lives were lost though miss kingsley saved herself more than once from being swept away by the strong current by clutching the rocks and holding on till the craft was righted once indeed a man was missing for several hours after an upset and was eventually found perched on one of the pinnacled rocks in the rapids miss kingsley went nearly a hundred miles beyond Njoli and then returned to a place called Kangway, from which she set out with seven natives on an overland journey to the Rembo River. It was a march of many days, and a large part of the route lay through the region occupied by the cannibal Fangwes, one of the few tribes in Africa which eat their own dead. 
the picture which he gives of this people and their manner of living shows them to be utter barbarians they are always at war with one another and their cannibalism is of the most pronounced type her escort were greatly terrified at the mere thought of entering this district but she guaranteed that no harm should befall them and they trusted her implicitly she herself was fully conscious of the horrible risks she ran and as she says there were many times when i have wandered in going amongst the strange tribes whether i should not end in the stew-pot at night but i never felt nervous i knew before i started that i was running certain risks and i had just made up my mind to them as the little band of explorers approached each fangway town it was found to be in a state of defence and the leader often fell into some trap which the inhabitants had laid outside the place for the enemy throughout the country they discovered numerous traps and every kind of obstacle placed in the paths their progress was also hindered considerably owing to the presence of three fangway elephant men in the escort at almost every town the expedition was stopped by the inhabitants who wanted to eat these men as they considered them to be enemies it was not always an easy matter to pacify the people but the daring traveller succeeded in saving her men on every occasion sometimes by persuasion sometimes by threats of punishment and sometimes by a trifling present to the chief man she saw many gorillas but they generally made off on her approach one however more curious than the rest caused them a little trouble till he was finally shot by the elephant men he measured five feet seven inches in height miss kingsley carried off two of his great teeth as a memento on the return journey she was forced by tribal fighting to go out of her path and came upon the unexplored lake and covey she sailed across this lake at a point where the shores were as far as she could judge about ten miles distant she also crossed the little-known range of mountains called sierra del cristal varying from six to eight thousand feet in height this range is belted round by mud swamps whichever of us happened to be at the head of the party says miss kingsley when we struck one of these used to go down into the black batter-like ooze and try and find a ford going on into it carefully till the slime was up to the chin i shall never forget one experience in the great tidal swamp which connected with the rembo we waded for two hours through it up to our chins all the time and came out with a sort of astrakhan collar of leeches indeed our appearance on entering andorco was more striking than beautiful each of us being encased in mud which was streaked with blood and bespangled with flies when miss kingsley returned to gaboon after an absence of two months and told the story of her adventures the authorities and traders expressed their astonishment that she had returned alive had they known her purpose they would probably have prevented her from starting not satisfied with what she had already accomplished the intrepid lady next went to victoria in the cameroons to undertake the ascent of the great cameroon a peak rising to a height of nearly four thousand feet it was a terrible climb she had no tent she had to sleep upon the ground in the open air and she was frequently drenched by heavy rain in spite of everything however she led her party up and down again in safety in ten days 
when she dismissed her guides she asked them if they would make the ascent with her at some future time by a different route the reply was prompt and a great compliment to miss kingsley's leadership yes they said we go you take care of us proper notwithstanding the hardships she went through she enjoyed good health and was never once attacked by fever early in december eighteen ninety five she arrived again in liverpool after about a year's absence during this time she had encountered some of the most remarkable and disagreeable experiences which woman has ever been called on to face in a savage country end of chapter sixteen end of heroines of travel by frank mundell